This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible by MailChimp. MailChimp is an easy-to-use marketing platform with a name that might make it sound like they only do email. But they do just about everything to help businesses grow, like ads, postcards, landing pages, audience management tools, automations, reports, and more. You could say MailChimp grew so much that they outgrew their name, and their marketing tools can help you do the same. Go to MailChimp.com to sign up for free and see how MailChimp can help grow your business. MailChimp. They do more than mail. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 10th, 2019, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Dot com. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of The Civilian Test where we are broadcasting, recording live from the tested office, That's not Las Vegas. still special. It is very special. It's special. There's only going to be one of these days ever, one of these moments. That's exactly right. You know, ever. I think when I see people and a new person I've never seen before, I think to myself, I should be amazed that I'm seeing a new form, a new person. Childlike wonder, Jeremy. A person with qualities and I've never seen before. Let's go to a different country. Travel. Have you never heard of Stranger Danger? <laughs> we are in San Francisco, not in Las Vegas, even though many of our comrades and colleagues may be there right now for uh, the annual Consumer Electronics Show. But we'll be talking about some of the news coming out of there. But welcome our two hosts, Jeremy Williams. Hi. And Kishore Hari. Are you having any CES FOMO? Yes, 100%. Oh, really? I didn't go. This is the second year. I thought it would be easier not going because I didn't go last year. Yeah. And last year, oh, last year I didn't go because uh, I was in New Zealand. We were filming with Adam for his short film. And so that was like a worthy trade-off. But last year I had lots of FOMO. Even though I was in one of the coolest places in the world, I was still reading the news. I missed the great... CES blackout of 2018, <laughs> where all the power went out around the booths, and I thought it'd be easier this year, especially, I think CES, of course, has been less interesting over the years as big companies find other venues and avenues to share their product news. Uh, still, well, following Twitter feeds of the people that we follow at in Vegas right now, at CES, there seems to be a lot of cool stuff that I wish we could be there to try out. But aren't those Twitter feeds enough don't you get the information, or do you really feel like you have to use it? Well, if I had not been going to CES for 10 years prior, yes. I think that the coverage of CES in general overall is good, if, if not great. And some years are better than others. And I think reporters are good at, are are smart enough not to be fooled by the dog and pony show. And can and it's fun to see them try to parse out, and fun when we were going to parse out what was actually interesting from all the 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 cruft and the the chafe yeah but uh knowing that there's so much cool stuff like and, and having gone for 10 years it's i feel like reading about the stuff is insufficient i mean i, I read about stuff even when i'm there when i when i, when I was going to see yes you can't see everything you're still reading what other people are covering and part of the fun is you read that someone took a meeting and saw some cool demo on the show floor uh one day and then it's it's the scramble to try to see if you could get that same demo uh, the next day, and I can't do that now. Well, I'll tell you, right now, I'm watching video that happened an hour ago mm. of uh, someone flying a drone, the Verizon CEO flying a drone in Las Vegas, like from Las Vegas. The drone is in L.A. Oh, not like, from Vegas to L.A. No, it, like the flying, drone is in L.A. He's well, flying he it is in Vegas. Over he's the internet. Okay. He's, he's, he's remotely. flying it remotely. Over I 5G. find that less impressive than if he flew a drone from Vegas to LA. <laughs> <laughs> that t wake me up when that's happening. Uh, the thing I don't miss about CES are the press conferences. I think for the first you know five or six years we were covering CES, we went to as many press conferences. There was a whole day devoted to press conferences. The day zero before the show floor opened, and we learned quickly 
I mean, I guess slowly because it was half our, uh, f- half a decade before we stopped doing them. But uh, we learned eventually that the press conferences are really not worth it. That you, the most interesting stuff is chatting with engineers um, and people on product teams on on the show floors and actually talking to the people who determine what goes into you know your Sony headphones and your cam cameras yeah. and and TVs and and why certain decisions are made. Um, so we will be talking about CES, but before we do that, how are you guys doing? Oh, fine. It's been a week. Yep. Yep. Anything new? Any 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 other the uh, year. Uh, lists of the second week of 2019? Any new things in San Francisco that you've knocked off your family list? Oh, man. No? No? N- you? No? no? All right. New Year's resolutions. Why? Do you what? have something you want to say? No. I just want to hear your... No. He was my trying li- to live my, vicariously I, through exactly. two my, of the most boring people in San Francisco. <laughs> it's a real it's, mistake. It's, it's making me feel great about my my life right now. Life is great. I had a Baby's cute. we had a minor plumbing emergency yesterday. I'll uh, tell you all about it. No. Yeah. No, yeah. Oh my. All right. Wait, we work. should talk because I have to get some drywall repaired. <laughs> I bought a, a chest freezer for my house. It's actually one of the more <laughs> exciting things that's been happening in my life recently. Trader Joe's trips there have never been, uh, are never going to be the same again. All right, should we get okay. to pop culture? Yeah, uh, because there's so much big news out of CES, we're going to skip, I think, the biggest story of the week. I think the biggest story is CES in general. But let's jump into some pop culture. So the Golden Goal Globes were uh, this past week, mm-hmm. and lots of surprises. You know, uh, the show that you talked about, Kishore, the uh, Bodyguard, was nominated. Uh, along, I didn't realize it was um, uh, Richard Madden, who was um, uh, young, young Stark. Um, uh, what was his name? He was Ned Stark's son, the eldest son. Yeah, in, he in gets Game of Thrones. Like he it, lasts it, it, whatever a it, couple episodes. It, it doesn't. Right? It, it doesn't end well for him. Wait, he's in Game of Thrones. Yeah, briefly. Well, huh. not briefly. For a whole season and a half, at least. Yeah. That's brief. That brief. I watched episode one, by the way, of Bodyguard, and I did. You were right. Like it dives in, and in fact, the first see, the first scene, the first fifteen minutes is probably my favorite part of that whole episode. Mm. It grabs you. It's and intense. It doesn't let go. But my problem with it is that it is so obviously trying to do that. Oh yeah, it it does all sorts of mechanics with the music and like yes, and but it's trying to give you like I appreciated it because it, it got me. <laughs> okay, I so, didn't go back because uh, yet. I yeah. don't believe it won though for what it was nominated for. What did win for best dramatic TV series was finally well deserved the Americans, and so we're actually in our household rewatching all of the Americans because I hear it sticks the landing, mm-hmm. so it's worth then finishing. Uh, that show. Uh, Golden Globes, of course, celebrates not only television, but film, and also film in an interesting way. For uh, the best films of the year, there are two major categories, best dramatic film, the dramatic picture, and then musical slash comedy, which in past years and recently, very kind of controversial in terms of what studios put, what it becomes political and a strategy almost, what film studios um, nominate and put up for nomination in each of these categories. If they feel, feel like a film has a better chance because the field is less competitive in the musical slash comedy, they'll shoot it in there. Uh, so for example, Mary Poppins was nominated in the best dramatic film category as opposed to best musical musical slash comedy. <laughs> that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Nope. Same with uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, which won best dramatic motion picture. I would call that a musical, mm-hmm. um, a star is I would, born. I would call it a mistake. That's what I would call yeah, it. I, I too call it a mistake. Uh, I think that was a, a surprise for everyone. It's a, it's a fine film. I just don't think it's the best film. And I hopefully the momentum from Golden Globes doesn't necessarily translate to Oscar success because I think there are other films out there that uh, are better deserving. Did Mary Poppins win anything? It did. Uh, I don't think it won anything. Yeah, I, I saw it. I was not blown away by it. I thought it was okay. Uh, I I love the original one because it's so unique. It's it's a film that is for any age group, and when you have young children, you know, young like two, three, four year olds, there's not that many films that don't have scary moments or villains or things that you might think are completely, you know, fine, but a child might find terrifying. It's and true rated G film. It is a true G film, and uh, the second one didn't follow through with that. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mary Poppins was nominated for musical comedy. The thing that I thought was weird, Green Book, which I think is more of a drama, was also in the musical slash comedy. And which is getting a ton of pushback because it's based on a real life story. And the people that it's sort of based off of disagree with the characterization, yeah. like some of the facts. Yeah. A Star is Born also nominated for drama as opposed to musical slash comedy. Weird. It's best soundtrack of the year. It should have been, it well, should have won, honestly, for best musical slash comedy. Two things that Golden Globes got right. Best animated feature. Yes. Spider-Man Into the, Into the Spider-Verse. And uh, best original song was from A Star is Born, Shallow, which is a pretty gripping song. Not the best song on the, on the soundtrack, I would say. Fine, it should still win. It it well deserved in that winning, but because it represented the uh, the, the soundtrack for for that that film. Mm. Uh, other things, um, gosh, uh, best animated film, Isle of Dogs was nominated. I forgot that that was even out last year. Uh, Have either of you watched Killing Eve, which is like the show everyone tells me that I should be watching? No. Which is the Sandra O, oh, and I'm forgetting the other actress. Like it's a sort of a cat and mouse. Mm, I, it's thriller. a BBC show. Yeah. And I, I've also heard it um, highly recommended. It's it's on my queue. I've, I've saved it on, on YouTube TV. Um, TV yeah. series is also split between dramatic and musical comedy, uh, musical slash comedy. And the Kaminsky Method, which I believe is that Netflix show? Yep. Uh, that one. Uh, and so the, the best thing about the Golden Globes is it really surfaces content. And sh- con- there's so much, so many shows that I otherwise would not have picked up. I may have been aware of them, but I have not started. And now I'm going to go back and, and start watching some of these. I'm I'm really curious about uh, Escape from Escape at Danamora, which is the Ben Stiller directed miniseries that won. That's about a escape from a maximum security prison in 2015. Oh, based on a true story. Yeah, and um, Patricia Arquette is is in this, wow. um, and uh, uh, Benicio del Toro is, uh, and Paul Dano, uh, and it just sounds really interesting. Also, a thing where the real life people that it's based on have um, argued with the characterization of themselves, but they're less credible than the Green Book ones because, you know, they're murderers. Yeah, if you guys saw Bohemian Rhapsody, they, the filmmakers, that one was, uh, like, shepherded by Brian May and the surviving members of Queen. They look really good in the film. No kidding. And it's not that Freddie Mercury doesn't look good in the film, but it's not, like, the timelines don't exactly work out. It's definitely more of a a painting, interpretation, and an impressionist painting of his life um, than a than a photograph. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, moving on. Films in 2019. Two out of the three people in this room mm. have tickets already mm-hmm. for Captain Marvel. I didn't know they were on sale. They were on sale, Jeremy. Tickets it's, are still available, I believe. Wow. It's the Marvel movie event of the month. <laughs> of the first <laughs> three months of this year. Uh, Captain Marvel... Along with tickets being available, it was announced with a new kind of a, they called it, it's not a theatrical trailer. They call it like a behind. It's like, like a, a commercial. Yeah, it's like a TV, TV show. It's a minute and a half long. Definitely has a little more plot into it. We're at the point right now that if you already sold on this film from the first trailer, you should not be watching any more, any more footage. I actually feel bad that I watched it. But yeah. most people will. That's the problem. Yeah. I was Millions watching a football of... game and it came on. That's yeah. why I watched it. It was just on. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if Marvel's confident or not confident in the performance of this film, and that's why they're releasing so much footage. Whereas from something like Avengers Endgame, yeah. zero footage, <laughs> zero trailers. Even the th- third Marvel movie coming out this year, Marvel MCU movie, Spider-Man Far From Home, coming out like a month after Endgame, no trailer for that yet. Yet for Captain Marvel, they're really bombarding us. What is the low bar for the MCU so far? Performance-wise or uh, uh, box office performance or critical review? Oh I think it's gosh. Thor two in both situations. <laughs> I don't believe it's. I think well, Thor probably not boxes. Some, yeah, box. I think Thor two is universally agreed upon as the worst of. Yeah, the the critically okay. the worst of the MC. I, I enjoyed it. I like the director. He came from Game of Thrones, and um, there are elements of it I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I'm most interested to see how this ties in the end game. You know, you know, and I bet they're banking on that. Although the trailers have not, I mean, that could have been a marketing strategy. They could have really leaned on this is the, if you watch the stinger to uh, the end credits, post credit stinger to uh, Infinity War, 
this is the story that will tell who Sam Jackson was paging yep. in that moment. And that's a big selling point. I think people maybe already have bought into that, but they're not heavily, it's, it's not heavy handed. They really are um, selling this character, introducing us this character as a standalone character, a standalone story, and which I'm, I'm happy for because it's a really interesting character. Uh, but I, I do think they're showing a lot. So save something for the screen. Folks. I think it, it made me less excited about the movie watching it. Ouch. Yeah, I have uh, Dolby Cinema tickets. I'll, well. I'll take your tickets. You don't <laughs> want them. <laughs> Comes out March 7th, folks. You can buy tickets online now. Don't watch the trailer is our recommendation. A film that may will not be coming out this year and may not be coming out even next year on the Paramount slate is Star Trek IV. So where was it in production? They announced a director, the first female director of a Star Trek film, and uh, after they rec- that announcement came very shortly before the then announcement that Quinn Tar- Tarantino was interested in, well, in doing a Star Trek film. Yeah, uh, and so that kind of took the wind out of Star Trek for a little bit, especially when it was revealed that the Quinn Tarantino film uh, idea, which he is interested in, I believe, directing, not writing, uh, is set in the J.J. Abrams universe. And then after that, so S.J. Clarkson was the director that was hired. After that, there was the whole legal or uh, the contractual problems in that Chris Pine walked away from the contract. He was not locked in to be Kirk for Star Trek IV because they had announced, and then remember, they announced the, the kind of general plot of Star Trek IV before Star Trek Beyond hmm. uh, was was released. And that mm-hmm. was, it was going to be a re- reuniting of Chris Pine, C- Captain Kirk, and his father, um, played by Chris Hemsworth. And so you have the meeting of the two Chris's. Chris Hemsworth, of course, played um, Kirk's father in just the opening of 2009, but that was before he blew up with Thor. Mm-hmm. So well, he died. He died. Yeah. And so it was going to be some weird Nexus time traveling thing, right? So now the rumor, though, is that this is shelved because the director has recently signed on to direct episodes and, and actually direct the pilot and executively produce the Game of Thrones spin off show. And so if she's already committed to this Game of Thrones show, not, not only to EP it, but also direct an episode, uh, then that means they either have to find a new director for Star Trek Four that they may or may not have already, or that this this movie is just kind of. I'm okay waiting. Well, now wait a minute. Beyond did very well at the box office. It, it, it got an 85 percent Rotten Tomatoes, and I think critically it was, it was great. It has a three hundred and forty million dollar return. You know, uh, globally. Yeah, but Which, still, that's pretty good. I think it cost a lot. I don't think it made money. I think it's considered a no. failure. I think it was a $150, $200 million film uh, with all the special effects and and uh, and and then you, you know double that for marketing. And I think they were hoping, if you look at the box office for Into Darkness, you want an upward trend. Yep, for I hear you. Franchises. And Man. Into Darkness, I believe, made uh, more money. It's amazing what Into one Darkness is a s- bad small movie. misstep can do. Yeah, Into In- Darkness is a bad movie, though. It, it is. Beyond was was decent. I do think they're relying too much on like little nods to the fans, though. Into Darkness is a hundred million more. Yeah, and so if you're going to move in the opposite direction and make a hundred million less on your third entry, uh, they don't like that trajectory. And I could see why. You know, Paramount it, they recently had uh, not a great success with Bumblebee, although very critically yep. acclaimed. It has barely eked over a hundred million stateside. Um, it came out, unfortunately, for it uh, the same weekend as Aquaman and Mary Poppins Returns. So um, Paramount is maybe a little skittish, and they don't have a lot of big franchises. Transformers has the legs are are you know gone for essentially for Transformers. Star Trek, while a crown jewel of Paramount, uh, they don't have the rights for the TV stuff. That's all CBS. Uh, and then uh, I guess Mission Impossible is the last big, and you know Tom Cruise isn't getting any younger. Yeah. Um, speaking of Star Trek and TV show news, now CBS very uh, happy with the performance of Discovery, of course, and that's why this year we're not only getting Star Trek Discovery Season 2, which I believe premieres in like a week and a half, right? The 18th of January is when we're getting, uh, or the 17th of January, right, is when uh, Season 2 will premiere, but they're developing an animated show, 
And of course, the thing we're probably most excited for, the Picard show. Now oh, we have yeah. just a little bit more. We've only seen a little bit of inklings, like for example, Patrick Stewart's been in the writer's room um, and uh, he did the announcement at the big Trek convention. Uh, they've been writing it now. They haven't said if they've started filming, I think, but some more details is that it will have a connection to the Abrams universe. Now, don't worry, there's not going to be time travel. But if you remember in Star Trek 2009, okay. the villain, Nero, travels back in time. Nero. Nero. Mm-hmm. Nero. Mm-hmm. Travels back in time uh, to change the course of history and kill Spock or destroy Vulcan. Yep. Because using his mining ship, which powered by Borg technology, this is from the uh, prequel, the the, uh, the comic book series, uh, because Romulus is destroyed, the destruction of Romulus, right? There's a, the star went nova, yeah, Rom and and uh, I guess if the star went nova and they're twin planets, like Vulcan should also have been destroyed, I guess, in that timeline. But anyway, uh, that's in the that that presumably happens in the core Star Trek timeline. And it's after that event that Nero goes back in time and creates the Kelvin timeline. Right. So in the core Star Trek timeline, the furthest that we know about what happens in any of the the Federation space or any of the the Alpha Quadrant is that Romulus is destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you ever got to finishing watching TNG, but one of the big plot points of TNG is Picard's ambassadorship to... Uh, Vulcan and Romul- uh, Romulus uh, to help ferry uh, unification. In in fact, unification part one and part two uh, episodes of the show in which Leonard Niebuhr was a guest star. Oh, yeah. So uh, theoretically, the, the idea is that he, after Pic- the events of Nemesis, Picard continues to pursue unification, the joining of the two, um, the, the Romulans and the Vulcans, and after the destruction of Romulus, this is maybe where that show picks off. Oh, so this will be further in the core universe than we've ever gone before. I mean, they've already said the timeline. It's going to be yeah, yeah, yeah. at the end of the 24th century. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's going to be uh, set 25, basically however many years after Star Trek, Next Generation yeah. was off the air is how many years. It's like 20, 25 years later. Okay. So, but it could, it, it gives us clues into what Picard has been doing. And it totally makes sense. Post-Captain, Right, he probably won't be com- uh, com- uh, commanding the Enterprise, um, and he'll probably be a, a, a diplomat in search of resolution. So, when you say that it, it dovetails with the the J.J. Abrams universe, are you are you suggesting that we'll see like Nero depart? The F- Nero may be mentioned, right? Yeah, like the fact that these rogue factions from Romulus, uh, the aftermath of the destruction of Romulus. Um, is mm-hmm. a, is the thing that catapults the okay. 2009 the J.J. Abrams Star Trek film? That is something that they're factoring into account. I'm glad they're doing that because they couldn't not address that. It's weird though, because as you said, they they don't. It's two different parent companies. Yes, yes, but it's all Star Trek. Yes, right. It's all it's all it all comes back to Spock. <laughs> Spock is the thing that ties it all together. Yeah. Uh, and we're supposed to see uh, footage or we're supposed to see uh, that show premiere, I believe, by the end of this year, right? If, if Discovery is going to kick off CBS. Probably towards the end of the year. Though. Um, in 2019. 2019 will end with the Picard show. Looking forward to that. That's done. It's time to renew. It's time to re-up our, I guess, our CBS uh, subscriptions. So, uh, Kishore, what, what about Young Justice? I'm going to say something slightly blasphemous. <gasps> Young Justice... Uh, might be the best animated series that uh, Warner Brothers DC has ever put out. I think it's slightly better than Batman the Animated Series. Wow. I think Norm is and I are no longer friends. I think that's what happened. But have there. you seen this? I have not seen this. Oh, this well. is exclusive to DC it, Universe. Well, the first two seasons were on Cartoon Network, and it's it follows the younger versions of the Justice League members. So like Superboy and Kid Flash and like the Arrows protege. And what? Well, wait, so, so, so it's it's not like when Superman was a kid, right? No. So there, there's like a separate yes. character in the D- oh, it's, it's it's comics time. It's wait, a comics, minute. it's comic explaining time. Does Superman have a son? No, 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 it's no, a no. Clone. So, so he, here's here's what happened. Clone. When when 
DC Comics and Marvel Comics to some extent, uh, when they were first started, you know, the heroes were all adults, and they wanted to find ways to relate these heroes to kids because DC didn't have their their Peter Parker, which is a character that kids reading comics could totally relate to. Right. And so one of the ways they did that was they would tell stories of what it would be like when Superman was a kid. And so you had the whole Superboy. Muppet babies. Exactly, right? Super back in Smallville before he be, went to Metropolis, he was Superboy, and and so you had this whole like, okay, these the heroes that you were familiar with as kids. Yep. Uh, going into the you know the seventies, eighties, and nineties, a way that they started um, extrapolating on that was taking sidekicks and getting the sidekicks to team up. So whereas Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Green Lantern would all get together and be Super Friends slash Justice League. Well, they also had wards and sidekicks and kind of like mm-hmm. their younger versions, right? So for Green Arrow, it was Speedy. For Wonder Woman, it was Donna Troy. For Superman, there was another Superboy. For Batman, of course, there was Robin. And so what happens when these younger acolytes of these heroes get together, They and they fight crime their way under the shadows, sometimes literally, of their mentor figures, mm-hmm. it becomes more interesting storytelling. And, and Marvel has done this. There's a TV show called Runaways, uh, which is about the children and uh, of, of super villains. Um, and then uh, on the DC side, uh, there was the Teen Titans were actually the initial name of the team. So you had Donna Troy, which was, I guess, not a clone, but like a refabricated version of Wonder Woman made from clay. It's all in Greek mythology. Uh, there was Superboy, or there was no Superboy. There in, wasn't uh, a Superboy. No, it was, uh, it was um, the first Robin, of course. Cyborg, um, I think. Cyborg. Uh, Spectre. Yep. And so there was... Teen okay. Titans right. version. They grew up, and then now you have yeah, Young this Justice. Is too much now. And so there's a TV show about the younger superheroes. And so, okay. uh, so throw out Muppet Babies. This is actually, it, it's really smart. It's kind of intense. People die. You dissing on Muppet Babies? Yeah, I am dissing on Muppet Babies. Yes. Um, and uh, the first two seasons were great. It ends on this incredible cliffhanger at the end of season two, and it's six full years until we get another season. And it premiered on DC Universe last week. Oh, wow. First three episodes dropped. They'll be doing three episode drops every week this month. And then second half of the season debuts in June. And they were really good. Animation-wise, story-wise, what's what's Animation-wise is pretty consistent with what you're seeing from, like, the direct-to-DVD movies. Okay. It's That's just good. the story is great because they're, these are fallible superheroes. And I, I deeply appreciate that. Are they going to lean on the... Young, like the like the coming of age problems that these heroes go through. Very little. There's some uh, like romance kind of stuff, but it's not the the crux. It's based on Batman and the Outsiders. Mm. If you remember that series. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Uh, I will also give a recommendation not to a TV show, but to a movie based on a TV show, also animated. Uh, Teen Titans Go was a very popular, little more fun, comical, lighthearted take on young superheroes. This is Robin, Cyborg, um, who are the other ones? Raven, Beast Boy, and very popular, kind of like in a Powerpuff Girls era of uh, animated shows. And there was just released a last year, Teen Titans Go to the Movies animated film, which I, I uh, heard as a recommendation, watched it, and it is delightful. It is really fun. It's, it's, it's a movie that you can watch with your kids. Okay. Your kids will. will Is it really Muppet Babies this. level it's good? It's not Muppet Babies level good. <laughs> We're going to judge everything on that level now for Jeremy's sake. Is it in the theater? Uh, it was in the theater. I believe it's out on um, okay. on demand. All right. You can get it now. All right. Well, my son loves things with the word go in the title, like Pokemon. He's all Does about he like it. the Oculus Go? Yes. Oh, well, there you go. Does he yeah. like watching there games you. of artificial intelligence play Go? Okay. Next story. <laughs> Coming up on Netflix, uh, this is interesting. Not a new movie or TV show, but an animated anthology series from David Fincher Mm -hmm. and Tim Miller, director of Deadpool, who's also, I guess, directing Terminator 6. David Fincher has a good relationship with Netflix because he EP'd and brought about House of Cards. And uh, I forgot that. I can't believe this is an animation, of course, fits within Tim Miller style because Tim Miller with Deadpool, worked a lot with animation, and he, he uh, Method, I think, is the, the company, 
he runs, right? That does the, all the CG stuff. So animation, CG animation is what we're talking about. Although I believe there will be some um, a mixture of traditional animation as as well. Uh, but there are. It's called Love, Death, mm-hmm. and Robots. Good title. No Oxford comma. It's kind of bugging me for the eternity of this yep. show. Yep. But they're going to be adult themed animation, five to fifteen minutes, eighteen shorts, and a total runtime of over. Th- over three hours, 185 minutes. This reminds me of the Animatrix. Mm-hmm. And I like that. I like when curated, when directors and, 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 and artists and animators get together and curate an anthology series of animation under a certain theme. It's like it, it's the animation equivalent of getting the science fiction anthology books and, and reading short stories. So much good stuff coming to Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we won't talk too much about Bandersnatch, but uh, there were, uh, Netflix released two uh, behind-the-scenes Bandersnatch featurettes that uh, do interviews with uh, the showrunner, writer, Charlie Brooker, uh, along with some producers that talk about the complexity of the filming of the series. Have you watched the them? Series. Yes. Are they, are they tongue-in-cheek? Are they like in the style of Bandersnatch? Or they are. are. They are. They're not like straightforward documentaries. And they are. They are straightforward, but the... It's an, it's a YouTube video, right? You're not actually clicking, yeah, right. but they frame the documentary with the same type of banner snatch choose option, but you don't actually get to choose. No. It's actually left me wanting more because like I want to see what the other option was. Tell me about the writing. What tell me about the filming? Right. Tell me both. And um, but you get glimpses of the technology of the flow charts they had and the storyline endings they had on some of the screenshots. Uh, so you get to see how they were. Um, uh, how they planned it out, and how it was way more ambitious than they originally uh, had planned it to be. Oh, I could imagine. And where we ended up wasn't even as ambitious as they probably would have liked to have exactly, gone. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it's exp- it could have been ex- exponentially more yeah. complicated, especially when you were talking about filming, which often, you know, people film out of sequence. Like actors and directors don't film TV shows and movies. Most of the time, um, in the order that you see them, mm-hmm. and one of the challenges of acting is continuity and being in character, and that's why actors are have such a tough job. Yeah. Uh, but when they're also portraying different timelines, that kind of script supervision and continuity is super tough. Yeah. Right? Am I am I portraying this actor as if this had thing had happened, or the other timeline thing had happened? And how do you get those subtle differences? Yeah. That is that's a really interesting. The challenge. mental prep before the act, the director says action. Right. It's got to be intense. Right, right. Because I'm sure they, they couldn't experience the story. It was all on the computer, yeah. all on the script, right? They had a big script and a bunch of flowcharts, uh, so they didn't know exactly how people were going to uh, watch this. Ah, so we know that Marvel's coming out with, or Disney's coming out with Disney Plus this year with a bunch of prestige shows that they're developing right now with some familiar MCU characters, uh, Bucky and the Falcon, uh, a Loki TV show, uh, all with the same actors, as you know, from screen. Now, they have subtly retconned Loki's motives. This is funny. I don't like this. This is funny, though, because when you say subtly, it's a pretty dramatic retcon. It is. So if you remember, Loki was the villain of the first Thor, overthrew Thor, caused chaos, and then was like the primary villain of the first Avengers film. That's when I first saw him. In that he like led an attack on New York that killed people, and he was vicious. He His first introduction in that scene when he gets teleported in, he's just straight up stabbing people with his spear and, 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 and killing them. And, and he causes the whole city to bow down in front of him? Yes. And uh, it's very like Nazi-esque. Yes, and... You know, the, what they say is true. If you are a villain long enough on screen, you eventually will become a hero because people like your character. And Loki has kind of turned into a rogue character, an anti-hero. And so Marvel, in that they're creating a TV show around this character, has to redeem him. And so they've retconned his, his motives in, that, in the Avengers. Now he was under the influence of... The Mind Stone. This is just another millennial not taking responsibility for their (laughs) actions. It's funny because he was the one who put others under his influence. That's right. That's right. And it's silly. And so the the theory is that he was under Thanos' influence. Why can't you let no. let, just let actions have consequences, yes. character consequences? Characters evolve. They change. Yes. They're flawed. As you said, he's a flawed villain who is good now. Yes. And frankly, even if he was a villain, can't villains do good things? 
Yeah, and still be nebulous yes. in their, you know, it can all be gray areas. They don't have to be purely morally good. So why do they do this? Because it's going to be, it's for kids. Because because parents, because it's Disney. Because you can't make a TV show. It wasn't Disney with Adventures, was it? Uh, no, it was it was still Disney. Was it then? Yeah. Okay. But I don't think they planned on huh. his popularity right. turning or, him. Or becoming good. Yeah. This is the Vaderization of Loki, where you like soften what was a great villain. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. By giving them too much humanity. Yeah. When they're best character set. Well, you can portray these characters however you want when you're building the Lego versions of them. <laughs> and something we didn't talk about uh, last week. Trust the flow. Is that Lego 2019 announced how many sets? A hundred new, 112 new sets available last week. You know, I went to a Lego store last week. There's a uh, Overwatch sets you can buy now. That's the did thing you, I want to talk about. Did you know this? I didn't know until I read through. Brothers Brick has a, a rundown. And I went through and like, ah, I don't need to buy most of these. You know, there are a couple interesting ones. Some stuff, of course, tied to uh, Lego Movie 2, the second part. Some Star Wars stuff. None of the Star Wars stuff really jumps at me. Actually, the, um, uh, the, the really small 177-piece escape pod versus Dubak micro figures. Mm-hmm. I actually like the look of that what one. What about the San Francisco architecture one? Boo. I, I also say boo because it includes like a new tower <gasps> that's in the city, the Salesforce you tower. You don't have to build that though. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. This is so true. I like that it has a Golden Gate Bridge and Alcatraz and that's cool. What's the third building? Well, the Transamerica building. No, the, what's the, the, the ones on the, the far left? The brown one? That's yeah. the Bank of America building. That's so weird and nondescript. It has the painted ladies. I'm buying this. This is cool. There you go. It's uh, 50 bucks. 565 pieces. Let us know how it goes. Yeah. It has forced perspective, which I think is a neat thing. Yes. Right? Because it's Golden Gate Bridge. Like the, the two... e- like the E-Boy poster. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the the two pillars of the Golden Gate Bridge are not equal height, uh, so everything is relative, and I guess it's, it's, it's a... Oh, they're not? No, no, they, they're not in here, but they are in real life. Okay. Yeah. Right, so yeah. that's why this is the forced perspective. Wait a minute. Are you saying that the Lego set, they are equal height, just no. not in the photo? No, 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 no. <laughs> What you thought was correct. In real life, the yeah. Golden Gate Bridge, the the two posts are the same height. And the Lego set, okay. they are not the same height. Oh, that's so weird. So it is a forced oh, perspective The Lego build. set is like a flat. It's flat. Exactly. That's so weird. Okay. So you can put this in a shadow box and it's a forced yes. perspective look on a landscape of, uh, of San Francisco. Wow. So in many ways, kind of like your e-boy analogy. Yeah. That's funny. I'm not a fan of it. I'm going to build it. <laughs> but Overwatch, yes, the first of the Blizzard Activision Blizzard licenses for for Lego and I mean you're the one with the kid who plays Overwatch. Will he be will he like this? He, he plays Fortnite and Pokemon Go, but I he used to play Overwatch. Um yeah, I mean I'm probably more excited about it than he is because I still love Overwatch. Um unfortunately like it's not like you can buy any character that you want. Right, right. They're they're kind of packaging them almost two characters uh, in a set, two hundred piece sets. So not super expensive, twenty dollars. So you have Tracer versus Widowmaker, um, and why was like the women fighting each other? And then you have you know Hanzo versus Kenji. I don't know these characters. My computer's rebooting. Don't oh. play. We can't get any music for the we're, time we're, being. Don't worry about it. We're not going. Still, there's still oh, one more story. I think. <laughs> <Great>. in, <laughs> in, Turn my. I don't know what to do. In uh, unplug in pop culture. Yeah. Um, but with this license, what other Blizzard Activision properties would you like to see come to Lego? Um, I would love to see a StarCraft one. I would love to see a StarCraft Oh, please. That'd be so boring. No. What are you are talking you about? Are kidding me? I'll build some Hydralis right now That's to exactly shoot you what in the face. Say. <laughs> I, I, if, if you search, if you search <laughs> Flickr, and I know Flickr had the big you know, terms of service changes and a lot of people's uh, photos got deleted, uh, but a lot of my own creations are posted on Flickr, and I've seen some amazing Zerg lego oh, creations God. the one i want to see a ucs yamato oh nice <laughs> yes a giant battleship <laughs> jeremy i'm in the twilight zone <laughs> <laughs> not having it he wants to get move on well if your computer boots no, up no 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 yeah don't do anything don't do anything all I right know, it just decided to update on this one oh um i i would like i don't know maybe a tony hawk's pro skater that'd be fun a skate park or yeah that'd be fun or you know i don't know world of warcraft is activision right what, that, what warcraft thing like a big armor uh, uh, like a giant armor. Oh, I want no, no, I, no. I want the like uh, Iron Forge. You know, I want to build. Oh, you want to build a, a location. City. I <gasps> want like the Hogwarts oh. scale thing, but for what an Warcraft. opportunity! Because if you if you think about Warcraft 
2. I'll even go as far as saying Warcraft 3, right? Um, the palette for these the, the buildings, they're all kind of like 2x2, two 3x3, by two, three by three, right? Or even StarCraft, perfect for Lego to build small representations of yeah. what does the, the forge look like? What does the, right. the barracks look like? Be fun. Right, and, and and those even in um in StarCraft they animate and transform as you grow in your buildings, right? And they're they're kind of just as much as the characters. The buildings are iconic pieces, uh, but a dragoon. The best video game adaptation for Lego was Minecraft, and that's been done. That's the best. I mean, you can't get better than that because everyone thought Minecraft was Lego. Right. I was I, I I'm still surprised by how successful that is. Yeah. Because I thought that kids who like Minecraft would just stay in Minecraft. And for the Lego sets, like do your kids, when they build Minecraft Lego, are they building it like Minecraft and building whatever they want and using it? Or are they just following instructions? No, you, no, you know my son. He, he, does, he follows the instructions. And builds a diorama. But it's happy with that being a representation of the, the Minecraft thing that he's, he's known. If, yeah. That's interesting. That's, yeah. It's that's, that's, that's a different way of thinking. Lego is almost just like, if building my, art tributes. If Minecraft came with directions on how to build a house, like a specific structure, then probably a lot of kids would do that. Recipes? Like yeah. Like, like I guess blueprints? it has recipes for things to, be, but, to but make. Blueprints. But blueprints. Blueprints, yeah. That's, are there not communities for that? Like here you can see kind of step-by-step step the, the materials you need to, to build a really it's fanciful difficult. staircase. Difficult. And, you can build uh, any structure you want in um, Tinkercad mm. and export it as a Minecraft That's file. Right. That's right. And, and import it in Minecraft and yeah. they have that object. Mm -hmm. And when you build in Minecraft mode, it has those restrictions, yeah. the Minecraft restrictions. Yeah. Very clever. Uh, one final piece. One, your computer is still it's, oh, it's, it's almost, coming up. It's almost up. Okay. Uh, this is a kind of a, not a real story, but I was watching Netflix and it recommended for me this TV show that I watched two episodes of, with probably two episodes too many, but I wanted to bring it up because it's a weird phenomenon. It's called Slobby's World, which I think is a play on Bobby's World, which is a 90s animation, hmm. the Howie Mandel cartoon. And it's basically Pawn Stars <laughs> combined with Stranger Things. <laughs> so they took the, the format... Sold! They took the format of... Pawn Stars, which is like a shop, a retail, it's a, a, you know, a, a series about a retail shop. I guess AMC did Comic Book Men. So Comic Book Men is a good example of that, of like these personalities, these like shop owners who deal in valuation of like vintage goods. And for Pawn Stars, it's whatever random stuff. But this guy in a store, I believe it in Tucson or Phoenix, uh, is uh, specializes in '80s and '90s vintage memorabilia. Does so, he have some cool stuff? So it, are we it's wide like ranging because there's like he's obnoxious first of all. Like, I, I could barely stand watching it, but he does like rare Nintendo cartridges, like Mario Three sort of version cartridges, and like the, the format is very familiar. If you've watched any of these pawn store shows, where they have like people come in and like, uh, like, they can't negotiate. go that uh, yeah. exactly. They they do the <laughs> they do the uh, the Air Mags, the Nike Air Mags. Is an item from Back to the Future. Uh -huh. um, G.I. Yeah. Joe aircraft carrier? I don't know if he has that. I've only, I've only seen two episodes. He does like vintage Nikes, like Nike Jordans. Um, the whole thing, like, like a sneaker culture, big in the 90s, of course, and, and today. So like, I just thought it was like, this was their attempt at doing, of, of tapping into the strangest thing, nostalgia, 80s, 90s nostalgia, with the format of a pawn store show. Not for everyone. Definitely ended up not being for me. By admire the attempt. That's interesting. Is it? It's not all video game stuff, though. No, no, no. It's like shoes and like and, and fashion from the nineties and, okay. and, and and sports memorabilia from the nineties. But the guy's supposed to be an expert. But like the things that he pulled out that were like immediately, like because the idea is he would be also be an expert and tell me the stories of these things. Yeah. Um. So you, you tell you know talk about the Mario three cartridge and. I'd like to see that. Like I want to see a show about video game collecting. Uh, really valuable stuff, like surprisingly valuable yeah. stuff. That'd be interesting. Yeah. I mean, we know all the right people who could do it. But the question is, like, the appeal of some of these shows is the the kind of antique road show aspect, yeah. the valuation, mm -hmm. right? Like finding something at a, at a swap meet and, and then uncovering its true value and then selling it to a collector and, you know, making money from it, right? 
I don't know if the the people in the video game histor uh, like yeah. historical societies and and uh, collectors would be game for for that. It would probably just increase the value of the things. Yeah, yeah and like, you know, valuation is tough, right? Like, what it's, other? Yeah, you, what can they compare it to? You need precedent. You need a market right? to yeah just what, tell you what the value is. What is the precedent for a, a abstract like a um, for when when our friend Steve Lynn bought the uh, the NBA Jam Ball? Right? Did we did we talk about that? No. How much was that? Um, I I think I found the auction. I don't remember. But he tweeted about this NBA Jam. We must have talked about this on the podcast. Like we, we didn't NBA Jam. Yeah. When you think of NBA Jam, mm-hmm. you think of the NBA Jam logo. So many people think of the arcade logo. For me, it was the SNES cartridge. Okay. Right. It's an NBA Jam, NBA Jam, NBA Jam, and you have the basketball that was imprinted. In, in relief, yeah. NBA Jam. When I saw that, and you can Google that right now. I can't. Well, you can't. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you a picture. The NBA. Yeah, it says it says uh, behind it, Jam Jam Jam, mm-hmm. and you have this basketball that looks like either a airbrush, you know, painting, or a CG render. What, why are we talking about this? Oh, because Stephen Stephen bought it. But what? The original. This is painting? a real ball. Oh. It's an artifact. They made a basketball with that NBA Jam sculpted into it. What? And the actual ball, and the fo- that's a photograph of an object. Wow. And it went up for auction, and Steve bought it. For how what much? An obscure <laughs> thing to buy. And so there also was the champion edition with the, the one on fire. With the, the silver version, so there are two balls out there. He's on fire, and it's not like it's a real like it's not just half the ball; it's a yeah, full ball. Full ball. Yeah, you only get half the ball in the photo. But how do you value that? It's whatever somebody will pay for it. That's exact. The price of everything is whatever people will pay for it. All right, is it time? Uh, to... Do we have? Can we get a musical segment change? We do. Jeremy's just got to turn up the audio on the uh, <laughs> other side because <laughs> what? I didn't take it down. Oh, you didn't take no. it down. Ready? Yeah. Here we go. No. Oh, I said, here we go. And it's playing. It's not out. But no. Are you muted? Kishore has taken <laughs> over audio duties, ladies and gentlemen. I still got 18 minutes on my reboot. There he goes. Technology <laughs> new. <laughs> Better than nothing. All right. CES. Uh, how should we talk about CES and, and the stuff oh, that's been announced? Intelligently. You got to talk about the biggest <laughs> thing in VR that came out of it. Yeah, yeah. And CES has been, you know, for, for the – it's been about TVs and, and chips, but mm-hmm. also about in recent years emerging technologies like drones, 3D printers, and now VR mm-hmm. and AR to the, some extent. The things we love untested. Yes. So no Oculus announcements. You know, they did everything at OC5. Although they had a presence. They, they had a hotel room. They were giving demos yeah, to uh, people. Um, not Engadget. Who was it? Um, Digital Trends? Steve or? Wong. What was his name? You saw the review. It went up there. It kind of made a lot of buzz because they hadn't seen it before. Um, the Quest. Yeah, the Quest. So, yeah, Oculus was there giving Quest demos to people uh, who maybe were not at OC5 because it's, it's a place where you can get a, a bunch of uh, journalists in one place. Uh, but HTC had a much bigger presence, and they did actually announce new products. So, uh, first of all, a new Vive Pro. The Vive Pro I. What's new about it, Jeremy? <laughs> it has you- eye tracking. Yeah. Right? That's it. That's I it. I think, think that's it. It's yeah. a Vive Pro with built-in eye tracking, and there's no word on whether or not you'll be able to retrofit existing Pros with eye tracking, although that would be nice. Um, that's what that's what it has, and they're marketing to the enterprise. As the Vive Pro yeah. should be. Uh, and with Vive tracking, the thing they're really selling is foveated rendering, right? Lower performance requirements uh, with the idea of being able to do... Um, rendering specifically to where you're looking at. And I would say almost every foveated rendering demo I've done so far, it's not fast enough mm. or it's not meaningful enough mm-hmm. of, of, a, of a performance difference. Now, they think, I mean, it's it, foveated rendering is going to be important. I mean, I, I'm sorry, eye tracking is going to be important for things like um, multifocal, like verifocal lenses. Because you'll need to know where your eyes are, um, 
And those are lenses that change the focus of yes. the, the depth of the thing that you're staring at. Yes. On the fly. To help solve for uh, a combination convergence problem. Right. Uh, same with uh, augmented reality glasses. You know, this, this, the Magic Leap has eye tracking, mm -hmm. and it, we can tell it's not as fast as you would like to switch between yeah. the two focal depths. Mm -hmm. uh, so it will remain to be seen how eye tracking is implemented. I'm more interested in eye tracking from a social standpoint, personally. And, but, and I don't see these popular social apps embracing the Vive Pro Eye. You mean avatars? Yeah. Avatar representation. Everyone else in rec room or in big screen. Any place that I see other people um, hanging out with you guys, I want to see your eyes move. Like that, that will make you come that much more alive to me. And that's a, a very meaningful impact and, and something where latency would not be a exactly. problem. Exactly. And even accuracy, as long as you can, you can get a good sense, it is it's another point of tracking yeah. for something that we use. Uh, and that's important data. You would think that companies would be all over this because that type of eye tracking data is something they hugely value uh, in terms of um, just big data and analytics. Oh, yeah. For, for what you're looking at, what persons, you can get so much from what a person's feeling with eye tracking and what they're thinking about from their eye movements. Uh, and that's something that I know Oculus is probably very aware of. Do you think there's any chance, legitimate chance, they would be able to retrofit existing Vive Pros with it, though? No, I don't know. That seems like not, not a, I'm just going to clip in some new lenses and they're going to work. I mean, it, it seems a much bigger deal than that. Yeah. To tie into the existing data stream, that sounds complicated. I don't know. Um, and I'll be curious to see what applications support it, if they're strictly for the enterprise, or if, you know, I don't know, Rec Room or some other apps actually implement support for it. That'd be very interesting to wander in and actually see somebody's eyes moving around. Uh, uh, Raymond Wong was who I was thinking of from Mashable. Mm, he mm. tweeted, and, uh, you know, it kind of blew up on Reddit and elsewhere, that he was playing super hot at an, in a hotel room at CES on the Quest and said, this is the VR headset we've been waiting for. Oh, wow. Well. What, well, I mean, speaking of the Quest, what do we think of the announcement of Cosmos? Yeah, the the Vive Cosmos. It, it, that's unfair. Why speaking of Quest, Kishore? Well, because Cosmos is a supposedly inside-out tracked yes. standalone no. VR headset. No, 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 no. Isn't it? <laughs> I think like I, they must have been intentionally vague about that so that people would falsely make that connection. Uh, that's my only assumption. They put a very... Uh, a intentional or into that discussion. I think it's more akin right now, actually, to a Windows Mixed Reality headset. Yeah, exactly. Because inside-out tracking is the big promise, and so you don't have the setup for this is um, is, is much reduced, and um, it's good enough for vast majority of experiences where you're not required to track things behind you. Uh, so this is a new headset from Vive. Yes. Uh, and it is, I think it has Go resolution panels, if I'm not mistaken. And it's uh, inside out tracked, as you said, but it will require a PC hookup or potentially, they're saying, a mobile hookup. So the PC hookup, USB C connection to a PC, you would then still render and play games on the PC, presumably still Steam VR. But is it tethered games? Or is it, it is tethered. wireless? It, it is strictly tethered. It is for PC, okay. it has to be a. USB-C okay. source system, All right, tethered connection. The wireless promise is if you are then broadcasting that to a smartphone, then the smartphone becomes the decoder, the video decoder, and, and then sends that signal to the display. You're not looking at the smartphone screen, but the smartphone becomes... The smartphone relays the signal from a PC? Relays the signal or, or renders locally. Yeah, I would think rendering locally, but yeah. it's still wired front to the smartphone. Yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. And so that's the quote unquote untethered PC VR experience. Uh, not due out till quarter three. Is that right? Second quarter. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, sorry. The, the uh, Cosmos had no time frame or anything announced, and the Vive Pro I is second quarter okay. 2019. All right. What do you think about the approach? I don't know. It's not as interesting to me that like the all-in-one really is important. I think that that is crucial in order to break through to mass market penetration appeal, that kind of thing, where people like the Go can just take a headset and put it on, and it's easy. It's just it's ready to go. I think that that barrier to entry is what's keeping people away, not to mention the cost of having to have a, a PC. But the problem is that no one has the resources that Facebook has to not only build a standalone all-in-one six-off headset, 
uh, which you know Google Daydream, Lenovo did have a standalone sticked off headset, but no content, and only Facebook has that money and developer ecosystem to develop content because it's all if you're gonna, it's very local, it's going to be ARM based, it's going to be mobile experiences, and so you can't recompile simply your desktop experiences, and so for people who who are into VR for you and me, mm-hmm. I I would want a Cosmos that I can. If it was a wireless signal mm-hmm. from the computer, I want them to. T- mm. I want Vive to use that same wire gig technology that they have from Intel and be able to beam that to a wireless headset. So you're really talking about Windows Mixed Reality with wireless? Yes. Okay. I mean, if you really, if you really want wireless, yeah. okay, okay. I don't really need wireless that badly. The wireless aspect of Quest is not necessarily like the, it's it's hallmark feature for me. Really? Then what what is the hallmark feature? The the fact that I don't have to load the Oculus app and I don't have to like, um, you know, maintain an ecosystem of tracking of trackers and it's just all in one ready to go. It's portable. It's got its battery. It's got the computer in it. It's just, so it's, you're talking about platform. It's its own thing. Platform is the, yes. The, the console like independence. Platform. Yes. Ex- no, definitely the console like platform is it, and the ease of use that's provided by the wireless inside out tracking, but yeah. the actual content doesn't need to be I don't need to manage drivers. I mean, it's not like a, it doesn't rely on a computer. And, and that's a very compelling. That's a hard thing to sell to people, like to communicate, right? Right, because the Oculus has uh, reduced price permanently of the Rift to 350, which they sold a lot of over the holiday break or for Christmas. But to market Quest as... I think that's an this easier is, marketing thing because you're like, everything you need is in this box. But it's like no longer having to install drivers. Like that's not a <laughs> that's not a thing you're gonna sell. You're gonna what you're gonna sell, what I presume the marketing for Quest will be will be uh, standalone for sure, no setup, like, like the broadly speaking, yeah. no setup, pick up and play, and also a ton of games that you can walk around your space. I yeah. think it's going to be play wherever. There's probably going to be pictures of people like playing in their backyard and like yeah. that kind of stuff. By the way, you mentioned Daydream. Is, wasn't that the name of the Google sixed yeah. off attempt? Yeah. Their controllers were three off. I think that's, that, right. that's a that crucial was, difference. That was a big, that's a big problem with that one. Yeah. Um, and other bits of VR news from, from CES. There's some AR headsets. I know uh, Virtuix has, has their uh, AR glasses, which are not supposed to be like magic competitors. This is more akin to Google Glass, showing some data peripherally in your field of view. Um, there are a bunch of other AR glass companies that's got funding. I think they're showing some prototypes, but uh, we're going to hopefully reach out and try to see some of these in person and get some demos before we can report on them. One of you guys linked to one of those, which is... Um Oh, it was on digital trends. Uh, oh, the it, Nreal. The Nreal glasses. And this I was... feel like this one's a little different than when some of the AR glasses we're talking about. Really? Well, because this one's a full mixed reality kind of setup. It, it looks like glasses, but it's it's a mixed reality setup. Yeah, this looks like almost too good to be true. And and I don't know like how gen I don't know. I don't know how critical this this reporting is. But the the article makes it sound really, really good. Uh, they say that the image is very crisp. What does it have, like 1080p panels? Uh, but the glasses, they just look like glasses. I mean, it's nothing like Magic Leap, and it does connect to another puck. But yeah. still, Magic Leap is a big, honking it, piece of glass. I mean, you got to so hide those sensors. Those, it still has, like, half of your sort of field of view has, like, a thing that comes down from the glasses. So you can't, like, wear these glasses around, like, and yeah. they appear normal. But this is, this is the clever aspect, right? They're taking the profile... The, the, the limitations of what glasses look like, and as opposed to putting cameras hidden in the frames, they're hiding the cameras behind the lenses. And this also then, I guess, compensates and makes up for, or, or is an excuse for a whatever their field of view is, is because you, you don't get to see through the entire lens. Right. Right, you only see through the bottom half. These so you're things. saying it's a lower field of view, or the, of your world, than the Magic Leap? You've, yeah. Is your assumption? Yeah. Uh, well, the slam looks good. Like that's always where I start with. Like, how good is that? Because often that's the trickiest part: is you move your head, and the image is ghost behind reality. And the best slam, uh, the augmented objects are attached to your real world space, which is really difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the photo, the video that we saw of, of this one looks like they did a good job. So I'll be very curious to see. Plus, they're quoting a thousand dollar price point. Which that, is less than half of Magic Leap. That I'm much more skeptical of. But uh, what the reason I even mentioned this one, because like Norm said, there's a ton of different AR 
XR, yep, uh, different ones, is that Wired tried it on, mm-hmm. and they said the image quality was was pretty top notch. Which uh, they said fifty two degree field of view, ten eighty p display. And it'll all be about the content. Well, what are you gonna be do with, doing with it? Yeah, that's boy, that's that's hard. And, and um, we had people reach out to us there who are experimenting with using uh, third party cameras to do avatars in an AR with Magic Leap. So you have like a, a Intel Real Sense camera that you put on top of a shelf or monitor. It takes video of you, and then that pr- then projects you into a virtual space, mm-hmm. or, or I guess into the real space of someone else wearing Magic Leap glasses. So you can be a virtual person. I would like that very much. It's 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 funky because you have to have a third camera. I guess all teleconferencing works that way, right? Mm-hmm. right? You you have a display, and you also need to have something capturing you. Yeah. And you know some laptops have those real sense cameras built into mm-hmm. them, but it's another thing to set up. And it it's really kind of stationary. You're not going to be walking around when you're using it. All right, other uh, CES news. Uh, whew, where should we go? Nvidia big press conference. Oh yeah, RTX new RTX GPU. Is it or something? A little... Oh, the mobile. Well, I think they did a 260 or 2060. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so they did the 2080, 2070, and there have been um, some yield problems, some performance problems. People aren't necessarily happy spending price problems. You know, so much money on this. So a mid-tier RTX 2060, much more reasonable. Well, three hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, but pretty comparable to the ten seventy. So yes, so that's it's, it's kind of like the in place replacement. If you were previously going to buy ten seventy last year, yeah, you would just buy this. Like if you're two generations behind, then go here. And really, they're really trying to sell these other, you know, the RTX benefits like the ray tracing, um, and and going even going back to when we were talking about HTC and doing the fovea rendering. Nvidia has the uh, what's it called the the shading. Um, for um, uh, the multi-step shading, they have a rare version of foveate rendering hmm. uh, that's built into RTX, so you can uh, analyze scenes and render things at lower quality, certain parts of a scene at lower quality for better performance. Uh, $350 is, uh, that's kind of like the sweet spot. It used to be like the sweet spot for like a high-end <laughs> video card, right? Yeah. And then it went to 500 which mm-hmm. is what the 270 costs, and, and then, then Bitcoin miners ruined it and yeah. took took it up over a thousand. Well, I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Like I, they they definitely to... ruined it. But Nvidia has also done a great job of making us think that these cards are cheap because they always have the thousand dollar option now, the Titan option. Yeah, yeah. So I want to know who buys those cards because a year later, your thousand dollar card is a generation behind. Yeah. But the thing is, if you need a GPU and the twenty seventy is five hundred bucks. Now, now you're like, oh, three forty nine. That's mm-hmm. I can afford that. Yep. yep. And even though it it makes you feel like you're getting the performance of that two thousand series, but you're really just getting a ten seventy Ti with some enhanced with some feet. extra stuff. Yeah. Uh, AMD you know, also just had their press conference to announce new graphics cards, new Radeon cards, and interestingly enough, uh, the Radeon Seven, which will be seven hundred dollars, available February seventh is built off of a seven nanometer Ooh. process. Wow. That's bonkers. I mean, that's as low as we're getting, right? That's it, that's the floor. And then it's efficiencies and it's stacking them. Yeah. Uh, seven nanometer manufacturing process, Vega base, they say up to a 27 to 62% performance boost mm-hmm. on graphics benchmarks. They didn't release a price, right? 700 I, bucks. 700 bucks? February 7th. Radeon 7, 7 nanometer. It's all about the 7s. Okay. <laughs> also, the NVIDIA, um, I forget the two standards, but like the FreeSync. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, the NVIDIA G-Sync is NVIDIA, FreeSync is AMD. There you go. So, so in, NVIDIA is now saying that their cards will work with uh, the, free, the FreeSync. FreeSync monitors that uh, meet From what I understand, standard. that they will approve a set of them. But yes. it's likely that it will work beyond that with Hell other ones. Hell has frozen over. Yeah. This is NVIDIA kind of in a vulnerable position because the Radeon cards have done so well. And the FreeSync performance is great. 
and, and there are a lot of those monitors out there, people aren't going to, people are probably more likely to upgrade their graphics card than to buy a new monitor just because you're swapping from yes. FreeSync to G-Sync. This is, so, by the way, for people who don't know, this is the technology that, that allows your video card to sync its, ref to have like a dynamic refresh rate with whatever your monitor can handle. Especially when monitors go up to 144 hertz, for example. Yeah. I guess it, the monitor syncs to the video card. Yes. Yeah. And so you don't get any screen tearing and uh, it looks smoother overall. Do either of you have a 4K monitor that you use no, I, for I, gaming? No, I quad HD monitors. I have all. a 4K monitor. Do you, it doesn't matter if you're running 60 FPS on the 4K yeah. versus like 30, no good. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Like, I know it matters, but like. I know I can tell it. I can't do 30 FPS. At, it's just not tenable. Yeah. Well, because depends that's on what I think is interesting about this Radeon thing is that they supposedly are running some 4K games at 60 FPS easily. It depends on the game, wouldn't you yeah. say? You know, like it always decided before they made a game, is it going to be a 30 or 60 hertz game? And, the, you know, the 30 hertz games are just a little slower. Yep, yep. Uh, speaking of um, manufacturing processes, Intel had a press conference and announced some exciting new processors for the next generation. This is going to be Ice Lake. Now, the, these are the 10 nanometer processors, this is finally. 10 real 10 nanometer products, which they had a few products with 10 nanometers before. You just told me about 7 nanometers. Know, How can I be excited about 10? Graphics cards, they're manufacturing fewer of them. Hmm. Um, but for CPUs, 10 nanometer, especially for laptops, mm -hmm. it's going to be really important. Okay. Uh, Ice Lake follows up on Coffee Lake, which was ninth generation Intel. And um, this is part of their, gosh, Intel's before they were doing TikTok, TikTok. Yes. Now there's a different name for it. What is it? It is a, <laughs> a process architecture. Oh, no. Right? I want to say process refinement. Right, so they refine a process mm -hmm. and then they do architecture overhaul. And so I believe this is the process refinement to 10 nanometer. That's the talk. It's, it's the big one. It's the tick. No, I, I think the talk is the big one. Oh, really? I think the tick is the small one. Don't you start with tick? Doesn't matter what you start with. Talk is the big tick. Tick braces you for the talk. This is a this is an old. This is only a test discussion. <laughs> Everyone has different ideas right. uh, about this. Uh, yeah, process architecture art optimization. This is the uh, architecture step. Sorry, architecture step, not process step. Architecture step because it's not the process optimization. It is the change in actual. Oh my god. Architecture. What it means is that this year's desktops and laptops, or next year's desktops and laptops, will probably be pretty good. That's what it means. I can't wait. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. They they they're still getting milking more performance. They're able to maybe not exactly move along Moore's Law's curve, but mm -hmm. you know, there's still continuous improvement. I don't think we've seen any like benchmarking tests yet though. We've just seen what they debuted at that press conference. And uh basically last year we didn't get anything from Intel. So this is this is sort of overdue. So I, I'll wait for the benchmarks to see how fast. Uh, Intel also has, you know, the GPU side of their chips, and so Gen 11 GPUs on the, on their uh, desktop chips. They actually started also offering uh, ninth gen Intel chips without built-in GPUs at a more competitive price point. Um, so for people building PCs, mm -hmm. new options. Cool. Um, all right, uh, other stuff from CES. TVs. You want to talk about TVs? I guess so. They're there. That's exciting. They are exciting. Samsung, well, let's talk about what Samsung did. I okay. think there's biggest news probably on the Samsung side this year. One. iTunes support. Yes. iTunes movie support on existing even, not just new Samsung TVs, even yeah. existing hey, Samsung smart TVs. Apple Music just went a release on uh, Echo, uh, Echo like less than a month ago. This is big deal. The clothes, the walled garden has holes in it. Yeah. Except Gates. Gates in it. And <laughs> maybe this is part of Apple's eventual move, an accelerated move maybe, from uh -huh. just selling hardware and making most of their money from hardware to, to services. You mean the eventual move away from controlling the whole widget, which is what has made them successful. So you think this is a, a, a bad thing? I think they've done this. Apple. They've done this before, like in their dark ages. Like, it, of course, this looks like it's going to make nice. more money. Of course it does. You think that the as long as the experience is good... We will see. Are you afraid? Like, who buys movies on their TVs, like, using the built-in TV service? 
Do you buy and rent via your LG interface or your Samsung interface? No. No, I launched Netflix on that. No yeah. problem, launch YouTube on that. But I'm not buying and renting because you feel like it gets lost in that platform. I have no other LG devices. You can? You can buy movies on your LG TV? Yes. Like And who... Like you have to boot up your TV to watch them? I mean, yes. Was, wow. Okay. So this is Apple kind of muscling in and saying, muscling well, in. people people have iTunes already. People, a lot of people have iPhones. This is them You can buy it on the phone. I don't like that they're muscling in. They, they're acquiescing to the, wow. to the TV manufacturers. Of course oh. the TV manufacturers want this. Don't you think? Do they get a cut? That's a good question. Probably not. I don't think they get I don't think Apple would give them a cut. I mean, it, if, if I could watch my iTunes movies on my TV... I wouldn't boot up iTunes, or I'm I, sorry, I wouldn't boot up Apple, Apple TV? TV. Yeah, it basically. What's, yeah. What What's the point of Apple TV at that point? Right. Maybe uh, Maybe Apple's realizing nobody's buying Apple TVs because smart TVs are getting so. The built-in apps are good. Average. Finally. Yeah, and and the interface is good. Not only exactly, and you you don't have to switch inputs. The thing I hate most on TVs Jeez. is the delay in switching inputs yeah. and confusion with the home entertainment system. No doubt. But your LG interface is better than Apple TV by I, far. I love because the thing that Apple gave up on, and, and because of the remote. Really, yes. It's because of the, the the waggle stick. Yeah. Right? They realize that having a laser pointer, three off laser pointer on the remote is super good. And that touchpad on the Apple remote, Still real shitty. <laughs> no one knows which way's up. No, no, no. I have a case that specifically hides. Yeah. Part and it's n- not good. You're gonna have a hard time selling me on any of that infrastructure because, like, your TV's supposed to last seven years or something like that. Uh-huh. It, you know, maybe because the prices are going down, we're talking about five. But even then, you're talking about that hardware lasting that long as um, the software is. Iterating, and I'm just I'm not counting on the TV manufacturers to actually do this. Wait, why does this? Why what? I mean, I'm by, like his waggle stick is going to be ready for every no, no, software no. Com- he's component. He's saying you can now buy in a in a platform agnostic yeah. store, which is good, right? Which is good. Okay, and you can buy on if you have an iPhone, you can or if you have a Mac, you can buy on iTunes, run your phone, and go home and turn on the TV and watch it right then, yeah. as opposed to booting up a bunch of different things. And even if your TV is not Samsung and has iTunes built in, many manufacturers are now going to implement this year AirPlay support, yeah. AirPlay 2 support, which will allow you to natively, without an Apple TV, project from an i device. I hate that. Onto, onto your television. I hate the experience what? of that because you have to Why? keep your i device on, plugged in, and the, the, quali- it, the video quality. Mm, we've gone through this with Chrome casting. Yeah. With, with casting like it's mm-hmm. just it's not it's multi-device and you don't want to go through the process uh if it's verbal uh, is how you cast maybe if you just say like cast from my phone uh up to the tv mm-hmm. uh, i think that's uh, doable but i think the other experience is not great it's good for sh- for doing slideshows though it's good for showing photos to a bunch of people or video yes, that you shot. very sh- short video yeah. you watch a youtube video and you want to share that as opposed to launching youtube app and browsing that's what casting i think is for not for watching full movies not at least not for me uh other uh tv news oh we got to talk about the micro led let's part. do this this is other big samsung win probably for tvs at ces they're big well, last year they had a big micro LED wall TV. Wall, yeah, we wall. have to talk about the wall. wall. This year they also have the wall. Two hundred nineteen inches of TV. We just heard about the wall last night. Prime oh, time. why do that? I was <laughs> gonna leave that joke <laughs> under the radar. Sorry, and then sorry. had sorry, to sorry, sorry. break the sorry, fourth. sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's the same technology, and people geeked out over it last year because the idea is that it's this new, like, very microscopic LED that doesn't use the same organic substrate as OLEDs do, which degrade over time. So now you have a modular panel that you can sort of pair up and actually just push together and make a TV of any size. Uh, I am slightly skeptical. I mean, so there's some things that are great. The image quality is supposed to be like on image, par or better than OLED. Yeah, because well, let's you talk don't... about the, 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 what, why that is, right? The OLEDs were great and are great. The OLEDs, I, th- I think, are still the best you can buy right now, and then the prices are reasonable uh, because each individual pixel is self-lit, so you can turn it off for true darkness, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you, you get so many colors, so you have great HDR, and they're bright enough so you get HDR as well, right? Yep. So the only downsides OLED right now 
are um, burn-in and lifespan potentially because of the organic substrate. That's why the new iPhone, the, uh, since the 10, they've shut off much earlier than uh, yes. they used to. Right. And so with the micro LEDs, you get the same quality of the OLED in terms of like there's no filter, so you're getting the full brightness, you get the 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 uh, shut off, so you get the blackest uh, black that you can get, but uh, mm-hmm. you don't have the uh, risk of the organic burning out. At the same time, though, you uh, l- use less power because you don't have to go through this organic substrate, which actually tends to like degrade some of the power. Frankly, I'm not concerned about my TV's power consumption going from OLED to micro LED. I don't think it's like a gigantic difference. Mm-hmm. In the savings probably won't be the the cost of the TV. And like, and it could be thinner with a micro LED versus an OLED. But how much thinner do we like need at this point? Well, don't you want a thinner thin enough that you can have it unroll from a from this your is the entertainment thing. center? I actually think that's kind of cool, but. Uh, I think that you still have the same burnout problems. Like if a pixel breaks on a micro LED, you still, it's broken, you know, yeah. which is the same problem you have with an OLED. So I don't think it's as dramatic of a, of a advance forward. I mean, I think it's awesome, but they have a big problem in that. And they fully admit this is that they still don't have the manufacturing down pat for how to do this because these LEDs are microscopic. They're small. And they still have uh, RGB. They still have, I mean, they function just like LEDs, do, traditional LEDs. Do OLEDs not have RGB? I believe they, they do. Okay. Um, the, the paneling is really interesting. There's a video I saw, and these panels are about like a foot by a foot, and you can literally just, it, it, it's a big piece of industrial design, right, that you can have them connect kind of like If you have a wall Lego. plate, you can just kind of snap one into place. And it don't have to be square. It can be of various shapes. I don't know if it has any interest in the consumer space, like what that means. Like, I guess it's time to assemble the TV, kids. Well, no, no, no. What, I think what that means, that's a commercial interest because th- there's several RGB LED displays that work that exact same way. Mm. And you can make them as big as you want and they daisy chain. And if you do get a dead pixel, you remove a panel. That's right. And you replace it. Yeah. See, I feel like a stadium. Yeah, it's that right, kind of yeah, thing. It's yeah. huge yeah. signage. I think at that point, it's like the, the panels are as big as your existing well, TVs. then you're talking about existing products like we have yeah. those panels already so i'm not i'm not sure so yeah right then you're talking about like small form advertising i don't know the side of a subway like a retail maybe yeah i'm not less interested in the panels micro leds because they use less power you know where it's interesting long term hmm. your phone micro led yeah and, and and apple i believe bought a micro led um research company uh, or manufacturing company, and this isn't exclusive to Samsung. LG, Sony, Samsung, Apple are all um, going to be in the business of micro LEDs at some point. Give me the iPhone 10 with a micro LED panel that uses less power Come all day on. long. Come on, what? you're not going to care about that. Well, I won't care that it's Apple, but I mean, like the the 10 screen is beautiful. Yeah, right. So mm-hmm. I, I I would love a micro LED panel. Speaking of other t- TVs, uh, TCL and Sony were companies that debuted the first consumer 8K TVs. Okay. Snore. 75-inch plus. Why is it snore? Because 4K content. is enough? Ah, uh, there's content. no content. And we're the same problem we were yeah. five years Where ago. Where are you going to get your 8K content from? Japan. Using what? That's a really good question. But Japan uh, broadcasts, uh, they have AK broadcast cameras that they film sporting events in. So the TVs must ship with some tunnel, That's some right. kind of app that gets That's you right. yeah. limited content. Right. I, I've seen AK TVs in person. Uh, yeah. They had a, a New York Comic Con I won last year. And it is, if you can, if you want to get up close to the TV, it's like too much information. Well, that's what they said about 4K. It's like, where's, you can do Where's Waldo, mm-hmm. right, on an AK TV. Um, and... It just reminds me that I don't like Where's Waldo. <laughs> uh, the, the 4K TVs, what we also found, it wasn't just the resolution. It was HDR. It was the color quality, the vibrance, the brightness, the, the, the darkness uh, that mattered really. And it, I think we've gotten to a point where it's, it's pretty good. Although, I, I, until, you know, I, I, I will never say never. It may be that five to ten years from now, we're all buying 8K TVs. I read about a computer um, vision project where that did where, Where's Waldo, and it was really good at it. 
you know? Finding just Waldo. Yeah. I mean, that's the perfect computer vision product project. It's not easy. You would think you just It's not? I think it's like one of those things that illustrates what computers are so much better at than humans. Well, no, exactly. But I'm saying it's not as easy as just saying match this picture because Waldo looks different. He appears differently. Uh, Well, yeah, that's true. Every, every, uh, every spread. He has the same Waldo, but like his, he has his hand maybe waving. He may yeah. be looking in a different direction, but he is. He's got that hat and that shirt. Hat and the glasses. And the glasses. I think that's, those are and then the pants. Important things. Can we talk about like all the assistant stuff? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we have to talk about the the ridiculousness, and I'm both I'm both impressed and and dismayed at this. Okay. Google built mm-hmm. a ride to support to publicize their assistant. So imagine it's a small world where you get on like a little train that takes you through different parts of a Google Assistant landscape. It's a boat. Oh yeah, it's a small world's boat. I mean like I was trying to think of a relatable ride with like a little train I'll do train, I'll do train. All right, go ahead. But it had like six stops along the way where you hear like different scenarios with like real models uh, like you know model cartoon type figurines like talking to you and talking about how google assistant will interact with your daily life from uh helping you at breakfast in the morning to hopping in the car with the kid Mm. and the dog they built an amusement park for ces it's crazy all right is that out of our system yes that's enough of that let's actually talk about what it does I thought the most interesting thing, the conversation translation. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. What's that? So they have a feature now in Assistant where it can't, it it can not only translate a sentence as you're speaking to it from another language Uh into another language, but actually take a conversation that's happening in two different languages and translate that conversation. I don't understand. So a, a reporter who spoke Mandarin Mm -hmm. over the phone to a digital assistant was able to have a conversation even though they weren't speaking the same language. And this is interpreted in in real time. Yes. You mean like UN style? Like where they're wearing earbuds and you're getting the translation? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yes. Uh, Google also indicated they're going to up like the, how the voice translation works. Like when we're doing speech to text, uh, they're improving some of the processes there. They're going to add in punctuation for us with that. <laughs> no, I actually find I use uh, uh, voice to text all the time. I mean, this is the, the promise actually, of her. Yeah, remember when Milwaukee Phoenix was writing those greeting cards or yes. letters, mm-hmm. and he was just doing voice to text. Uh-huh. You know, punctuation is an important part of that. It is. You know, punctuation is is not as straightforward. Again, not an easy AI problem. Wait, you're to saying solve. you're saying it's going to automatically do punctuation? No, oh, that'll be interesting. Yeah, is it just pauses. Just and wait commas? till the Oxford comma debate comes to Google <laughs> Assistant. Oh yeah, what what about my M dash? Can it do Can it do the difference between semicolon and M dash? Because that's semantic. Do you have to put in like the ASCII code for M dash? Like, and well, I don't know what it is. The Google Assistant would would be able to have the shortcut immediately. Uh, then they had a wall up of all the devices that Google Assistant now works with. Our Air Mega, Air Filter. Uh huh. Now the Google Assistant's gonna work with it. That's okay. Yeah, I don't need that. Uh, there were so many devices. Like there was a KitchenAid came out with a um, uh, a Google enabled like screen for the uh, for the kitchen that that's waterproof and dustproof, so you could even put it in your sink and rinse off. You know, um, Google Translate is already an amazing app. I it don't know is. how often you ever boot that up, but I, I've amazed people with that app maybe more than other, any yeah. other app. I think I told a story about a year and a half ago where um, an Uber driver had um, uh, accidentally came to my driveway and we communicated via the Google Translate app because she didn't speak English. And it turns out that um, there was a problem in the Uber app and like somebody from Chicago had ordered her. Ooh, that's expensive. Yeah. It would have been an expensive ride. Well, I, I used it recently because they bought, I believe they bought WordLens. That, yes, they did. This app yeah. that was a third-party app, and you could hold it up to any signage, and it would translate it into your language and augment the translation yes. onto the sign with the same fonts and colors. And background and everything. I used it so I could translate. I was getting some tech support um, where somebody had logged into my computer and installed some apps um, that use Chinese characters, and I needed to have that translated. So I was holding my phone up to my TV, and I could read what they were seeing, and it was... Uh, 
I was just like stunning the other people in the room. They'd never seen this before. And I've also used it to do voice translation in real time with um, with people who spoke yeah, only but, Spanish. But having it integ- having that technology integrated in like a home hub, you know, like their Echo Show type thing. Yeah. Now, like you could have it, you could see it at like a hotel desk. And then it doesn't matter what language you speak. You just speak to the home hub. It translates the thing. You're having I'm a still real cu- conversation. Uh, uh, ha- but how do you do that? Like, are you are you wearing an earpiece that does does the live like babblefish translation? No, it it speaks to both of you in your separate language. So you speak your thing, and then it translates for you, and then they speak. So there's an extra step involved. It's not real time. No, it's not. I don't know how. Yeah. That would but the work. phone does that already. Yeah. But this would be, I, I think this has the ability to sort of walk between the conversations. So it can handle multiple yeah. inputs. Okay. So it's more natural. That's the promise. Uh, I think this like integration into a million devices doesn't mean a lot to me, but I think the improvements on the assistant features is is pretty phenomenal. Um, there's one I want to call out. It's not Google um, that I really like, but I don't think I should like it so okay. much. Yep. Uh, Lenovo came out with a tablet and an Alexa enabled base, like an Echo Show type base that you could take off the tablet. It's basically an Android Oreo kind of middle range Android tablet. Yeah. And then you could dock it and it would operate like an Echo Show would in your kitchen. What is it? It looks like a a dock. Yeah, it's a dock. It's a dock, but the dock has like the same kind of speaker as an Echo Show. So it looks like a speaker. Yeah, it actually looks like a flat speaker with a spot for a tablet, like it's a to slot in. Well, the, the, I've been looking at my Echo Show, which is in my kitchen. I'm like, why do I have a screen that just sits there all the time? What if it was a no. tablet that I could take out? But the thing and that makes use it as a tablet. The thing that makes those devices work so well, besides the speaker, more importantly, is the microphone array. Yeah, and so this it has speaker that. thing has that microphone okay. array in it. Hmm. Lenovo also was one of the first partners last year to do a uh, Google Home with the screen. Uh, it was a very large one, um, let's say like eight, eight inches, and they announced a uh, smaller version to be a competitor with the um, Echo Spot, and it undercuts that. I think it's $80, and mm-hmm. so if you're in the, really in the Google ecosystem, um, this one may be one you can look at. All, none of these do good video chat is what I experience. No. Your phone always does better. I actually removed the video Echo from our kitchen because... Mm. Everyone was staring at it, like, look, you know, watching for their feedback. And there's something really special about having an audio only interface. I think that there's that's not a step down in some respects. That is a new era. That is like that's new territory for user interface. And it's perfectly good for most things. In fact, it's better. I I totally respect that. But I like having the actual screen because, well, I'll actually while making food, like watch TV, like watch Ah, something from it's why there's radio. Or podcasts. Okay, guys. Thank you, 1950s <laughs> Norm. <laughs> oh, I just want, like, who did this? I forget. Oh, yeah, it was on um, I don't know, some radio program I was listening to. Uh, they, they talked about War of the Worlds when that was on the uh, on the radio in the 30s. I mean, it was early. And the Orson Welles. Yeah, the Orson Welles performs. This is one of Orson Welles' first big productions. And yes. uh, he produced the show World. I knew about the story. But what I didn't know is, I mean, I'd, I'd heard the story that many people thought it was real. That Martians, was apocryphal. That Mar- Martians had invaded. But what was interesting is that they had actually started the program with a disclaimer, actual multiple disclaimers, saying that this is just a radio program. But what caused the confusion was the most popular radio show went to a break, and then everyone channel surfed. And millions of people tuned into this already in progress performance of War of the Worlds, and it sounded so remarkably good that there was confusion about was this real or not. I thought that was interesting. Sometimes I wish what I hear on talk radio is fake. Yeah, and, and dramatic performance. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Is <laughs> uh, that it? Oh, one more bit of Amazon thing, Kishore. Oh, I secretly dig this. Okay, it's Amazon Key. It builds off of what we saw earlier with Amazon having smart locks earlier this year where you could have your delivery person with your Prime package actually unlock your door and put your package inside. Come in your house. In some cases, in the trunk of your car. Yes, in the trunk of your car. That's totally different. Uh, A little too creepy. So they dialed down the creep factor by about half, and now they have a garage door opening feature that's smart activated that includes a camera where the 
uh, a prime delivery person would be able to put your packages in your garage and then shut the door. Well, it, they've partnered with the MyQ um, ecosystem, which is existing. I, that's well integrated yeah. now. If you have a smart garage door, it probably is this MyQ format. So, I mean, that, I think that's smart. I'm actually kind of into this one. It's less creepy to me. It is less it's creepy. It's sort of a walled off area. I know not everyone has garages and stuff, but I'm kind of secretly into it. I want to talk about this Audi thing. Can I talk about this? Yeah. So Disney, God, like Disney is doing some interesting VR stuff. This is Disney and VR want to be in your Uber ride. And they have partnered with a, with a company, uh, Disney and Oculus. How do you do VR in a car? Yeah, right? So the, the, what's the problem with that, you would say? You would say it's the cars moving. And that's going to cause motion sickness, and apparently it still does to some extent. But, but ideally, this is—I think this is actually a really smart vision. It's just not quite there yet. But they released, they um, they showed off the first demo that they have of this, which is a, a Galaxy of the Guardians themed Guardians of the Galaxy. What did I say? Gal- yeah, right. Uh, called what is it? God, this is a long article. Uh, Rockets Rescue Run, where you get into a car, and they were on a closed circuit for this. Uh, so that's. Obviously, you're seeing that they're early days, but you get in the back seat, you put the headset on, and you are now in a spaceship. And you're as the Uber driver, you know, supposedly drives around the, the course. It's the turns are reflected in virtual reality of as course. part of your spaceship's run. So it's a it's it's a procedurally generated run. That's the theory. What what they did here, and that the reporter from the Verge admits, didn't seem terribly. Um, you know, program. scripted. It, it was scripted. Oh, it didn't seem terribly like. Uh, well, you can have audio scripting. There's a difference between telling like, if you know you're going for like a 10, 15 minute ride, right? Or they can calculate with Uber exactly the the estimate for the ride, and even then you can programmatically say no, no, no. Th- and that's where they're going. They want to create what they call elastic content, right. right? So that if you come to a stoplight, if you if you're uh, if you're <laughs> if you're stuck why, in traffic, why did my Star Tour not? What, where am I? Where are we stuck Rock, here? We'll Rock, put like, on. Traffic sucks in all galaxies. Well, Toy, <laughs> Toy Story Mania, for example, does that. Like when you're when the ride breaks down, you right. get like, hold on, everybody, the ride will be moving soon. Have some free fun, and then you get to shoot at the screen and get free points and you just entertain yourself. So they'll do the same thing. If you're at a stoplight, they're thinking that you have to like fix your ship, or you're caught in a tractor beam, and then when you start moving again, then you're your journey will continue. But it will also incorporate like the GPS data from the phone, so it generally knows the route. And it will obviously incorporate the car itself. If, if it starts to turn, then Built your, your ship will turn. What the, currently, like if they're on a closed course, you know that they can't do all this dynamic stuff yet. Um, but that's that's the plan, and I think it's really super smart. The problem right now is that, like, even the dry, the person who reviewed it said that the actual uh, fiction did not necessarily match the turns that they were making, it, uh, like the degree. Like they have to get it one-to-one. And Why when, wouldn't it be one-to-one if you have the accelerometer data? No, it should be. And, I, and, you're and right. Presumably you would even have that not only on the headset but on the car as well. And that's why I think they'll figure it out. But they just haven't quite yet. And the driver, the, the reviewer said they were a little queasy after this experience. It's called Hollow Ride, And I totally see the potential of this not as I think what they're intending it to be, which is a way to pass the time for for passengers mm-hmm. to when in their when they're in Uber rides. If you're an Uber ride, plenty of ways to pass time on your phone or just look out the window. That might be a fun way to just enjoy the scenery if where you are. Uh, but I could see this being a dedicated entertainment medium. If the idea is the ride comes to you, so you mean like you would kid go, in the back seat. No, no, put this on. Not, not only that, but like the point is, you would you would pr- presumably pay, but like we would be able to get our Star Tours rides come to us as opposed to having to go to Disneyland. You would just reserve a spot, and the the hollow ride car comes to you. you. Get you get in the car, and it drives, you know, for every location, a city, whatever. It drives a route um, that could still maybe be procedurally generated. But it drives a fun route. We're gonna, we know we're going to be on the freeway for five minutes. We're going to be on the city streets for for five minutes. Yeah, and you get a you get a fifteen minute ride. I just think it's interesting because the problem has always been with VR headsets in cars and planes and automobiles. That um, I mean, uh, planes and trains. That the movement of the vehicle is reflected in virtual reality. So you can't wear VR headsets when you're moving in cars. Yes, but, yes you but, can. But this embraces that. It depends on the content. Yeah. If you're in content where you're not, where it's not tracking good enough, 
or you're you're supposed to be locked into a certain thing, you're gonna get sick. Yeah. But if you're in a con- piece of content where it's just purely 360, yeah, content mm-hmm. like all around you, video playing, or and you're in a car, you actually will not get sick because it's just like looking at the horizon. It's like the car isn't there. Won't the car turn and you will yaw in the in the game? Like if you're wearing your go and you're in an airplane and you bank. That happens. Well, don't. I mean, that's if the con, that's again that's content dependent. Yeah. So if if it, the controls aren't matched up, so the controls matched up where you're just like moving through Google Maps or something or Google Earth in VR, you won't get sick. Hmm. I well, think where it gets really interesting, two people in the back seat, and if you can interact with each other. Yeah, that'd be fun. I think this is like the next version of Pokemon Go. I mean, my kids already want me to drive them around town so they can catch the rare Pokemon. Oh my gosh. But they're going to be in the backseat wearing VR headsets in a few years. That's a, I don't know, in demand. That's a, you're already putting yourself in a socially, a vulnerable position or an awkward social, a, a, a new type of social interaction when you're getting into a stranger's car with awkward, car sharing. Awkward is the new norm. Every, like it used to be what, seeing people walking around with Bluetooth earbuds was weird. Now it's the new normal. Now it's not getting in a stranger's car. The next step is getting in a stranger's car and putting something and blindfolding yourself mm-hmm. in a stranger's car and letting them, tr- and you trusting them to take you where this you know, it's it's right down. There's society. not going to be, be a person in the front seat. It's going to be your Tesla because in, I, I'm, I'm going to be the one in the back seat because I've rented it because you're at home. Oh, so and you're saying you this is sent it th- off. This is in a world where you're eliminating the, the driver. Yeah. Already. I don't know. Could be. Will be. Look at what you're talking about. Oh. You're talking criticizing me for having a screen in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you doing in the backseat of it? Hey, let's get driverless cars. Oh, this like... car accident, this crash was really realistic. This is downtime. I just think it's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a way to get a motion simulator ride for, you know, in the real world. How about as opposed to something as engaging as necessarily as engaging as a Guardians of the Galaxy themed rocket run, something mm-hmm. more meditative? Like the time if i if i'm in a driverless car and i have a 45 minute drive somewhere it's a great place for me to maybe take a nap or put on a headset and get some meditation in and get some maybe more more uh, more zen like vr experience um, that's great i'm i'm sure there'll be room for that as well it's not as not as a not as sexy as a rocket raccoon ride no all right. Uh, I think that's all for CES as we're recording this. There will, of course, be more stuff coming out of CES after we record the podcast. So we'll talk about that stuff next week. Uh, there is some more general tech news. But before we start talking about that, I want to thank the other sponsor that makes this episode possible. And that's Lutron from uh, Caseda from Lutron. Caseda from Lutron is a smart lighting control system uh, powered by Lutron pioneers in smart home technology. With Caseda, you can schedule your lights to come in, come on at dusk so your family always comes back to a well-lit home. Uh, It takes your smart speaker, Alexa, Google Home, Apple HomePod, and makes it more powerful by letting you control your lights with your voice. Caseda is the most connected smart lighting brand, and it works with more smart home devices than any other smart lighting brand, letting you pair lights with other things like security devices, thermostats, music systems like Nest, Sonos, and more. And because it's from Lutron, you can rest easy knowing it'll just work. We use one of these systems in our nursery as we need to turn on lights with our voice command and we have an echo in there and it just saves us having to get up and use the traditional light switch when we have handful of baby so get smart lighting the smart way with caseta by lutron search for caseta that's c-a-s-e-t-a or check out lutron.com to learn more caseta by lutron welcome home to peace of mind so we have some more technology news we do let's talk about some last bits of tech news how about some uh Electric car news, electric vehicle news. Do you know the uh, They Might Be Giants song, Electric Car? I do not know. Ooh, that. play that. Play that. I'll make you feel good. I, I will bookmark that note to play it. I mean, in your car. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. While you're driving it. All right. It'll make you feel good. All right. I'll, I'll see if I can turn that on. Uh, Tesla, some Tesla news this week. Uh, they have a uh, launch, I guess, broke ground on the new Gigafactory in Shanghai. So they're going to start manufacturing low end, the entry level Model 3s there. Uh, hopefully, they say by end of this year. Now, 
Elon Musk retweeted a roadmap not from a Tesla employee, but we assume this is some type of confirmation of their intended roadmap Mm -hmm. uh, for Tesla over the next two years. But the idea based on this image is that they would be announcing a Model Y this year, announcing Mm -hmm. a model uh, pickup truck, Mm -hmm. and then start producing Model Ys in like the next two years. Okay. So Model Y is the uh, the Model Three equivalent of the Model X. Their small SUV uh, crossover, um, which they would manufacture, I guess, in both this new Shanghai Gigafactory as well as somewhere in the United States as well. The Model Three is now the, I guess, confirmed to be the best-selling premium car of 2018. Okay, sold a bunch in 2018. All of those Model Threes. None of them have the hardware necessary to run full autonomous driving. The, the, the processor, the computing Wait, they haven't necessary. started shipping that yet? They have not. Wow. And there is a Reddit thread where, uh, I guess, Tesla uh, devotees have talked about, uh, uh, speculated what's going to be in HW3, hardware three changes, because the camera systems, presumably, will still be the same. And this is Tesla has said the the cars will be built starting at the first half of 2019, and there will be a simple quote unquote simple computer upgrade for all existing Model Threes because the the sensors and the cameras and the radar will all be the same. But they've gone through some firmware, and they've deduced that one the computer is called Turbo, and I think it's based off of a Samsung. 7000 series SOC, ARM-based processor, A72 cores, um, which is about uh, a processor made in 2015, 1.6 gigahertz with a GPU of uh, 250 megahertz and memory speed of 533 megahertz. So the, the only the speculation here is that Tesla is in this hardware upgrade. It's not one. It's not custom hardware they would be potentially making. Uh, the brains of this will be updated to a SOC that was released in 2015, already a kind of dated SOC. But most of that heavy lifting would be done with a special Tesla PCIe device uh, that would act as the, uh, the, the neural net processor. Okay. So... It, it just speaks to what type of hardware, the assumptions of what type of hardware we need to get cars to do full autonomous driving. And is that the only thing this new HW3 will give? Full autonomous driving. Yeah. I mean, that's there's no other cool features we can look forward to. I think presumably like, the assumption is that this is what gets us next step yeah. to full autonomous driving, right. even though Tesla's already said that don't expect that anytime soon because of regulations. I promised my family we'd see it in the next two years. Am I going to be wrong you're not going to be wrong. All right, good. I think you'll be right. I think you'll be right. You, 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 you're, is the promise in the next two years you'll see it on city streets? Yes. That you can buy or being tested? Uh, I won't be wrong if it's just being tested. That you'll, be, you'll be fine. Okay, good. I, I, I think you'll be absolutely fine. Uh, Volvo released the first image of their Model 3 competitor, just like the back of the car. That's even, it's called the uh, Polestar two and it's all electric uh it will be uh, around the fifty thousand dollar range and production which they confirm will be somewhat low volume will be uh will start in 2020 so uh they're still a ways back okay you know like any good product take your time do it right yeah um and i think what else do we have in terms of electric <laughs> vehicle news? Half Life Two confirmed. Oh, that's um, should it be three? No, oh, oh yeah, uh, Half-Life federal Half-Life tax three. credit. Um, it's in, it's in twenty nineteen already. Federal tax credit for Teslas cut in half. I think even for GM, uh, GM has now sold their what two hundred thousandth mm-hmm. vehicle, and so if you're buying a Chevy uh, Bolt, um, you're also not going to get the full tax rebate from the federal government. I have to explain the Half-Life 2 joke. Okay. So uh, there was an announcement this week that Eric Wolpa, who oh, yeah. was one of the original writers of Half-Life 2. And less an announcement, more of somewhat a, a leaked email yeah, it was leaked confirmation. Email. He just confirmed he's going back to, it was confirmed he's going back to Valve. Is back at Valve, right? Yeah, is is back at Valve. And that's why I wrote an email uh, a in our show notes that says Half-Life 2 confirmed. Mm-hmm. 
I thought that was funny. I mean, w- we all hope that Valve is either working on or has intention to to make a AAA PC game, maybe even VR game. Would we be disappointed if Half Life Three or whatever next full fledged game they make is VR exclusive? Would we disappointed? What would the gaming community be disappointed? Who, oh, I mean, at large, yeah, probably, probably. S- would Jeremy Tough be disappointed? No. no, 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 no. I mean, the thing with Half Life is the thing that the, the thing that made Half Life two and and one to some extent um, so so groundbreaking isn't the the story necessarily, but the implementation of novel mechanics. You know, Half Life one, the narrative mechanic of having a seamless you know mm-hmm. story playthrough without discrete levels was the revelation with there. all the, the world building in the beginning without no you know with no action mm-hmm. and then with half-life 2 the integration with the physics as the yeah. primary gameplay mechanic was the big revelation there so they got to do something different with yeah i guess the problem is they don't got to do anything in order to make payroll you know that's the problem like they yeah. used to have to make games get right. them out if you're gonna not be bankrupt but I'm, now they've got steam i'm out of the valve prediction game yeah. Uh, Pepsi is bringing co- robots to college campuses. These you are know, the same types of uh, snack delivery robots. Were you? I was at Berkeley uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and they have like these Kazoom robots that you can order food, and they're these like Pepsi. They're these really small robots that have lids that pop open that you can order delivery food. For so if you're like on in a campus. study hall, you're sitting on the lawn outside of the quad and you can say I'm at this geolocation bring me the robot bring me a drink the robot will have inventory and it will deliver you a cool refreshing beverage I think it it gets loaded by the delivery person from oh. when you order and then it comes over to where you are on I, campus uh... and there but the, what's hilarious about it are these there are these tiny robots with little hatchbacks that are parked next to bike racks all over campus and that's Charging. what the yeah just chilling and that's what this Pepsi thing is. This yeah. story is. It's the same idea. They're, it looks like they're uh, they're not manufacturing these robots. These those, these snack bots, as they call them, um, but they're using a, a third you know, third party company. What does it say? Um, yeah, Berkeley has a uh, Berkeley has these robots. Yeah, I, they're adorable. I, I I would be more interested in the robot that has a large supply that I can like if I see it and I want like oh I'm I'm thirsty now then I can send a signal unlock it and then the moving cooler essentially yeah I called it Kazoom it was Kiwi is the Kiwi. name of the robots yeah okay yeah. this is weird <laughs> uh there's an interesting new video game mandate that took effect January 1st of this year it's part of the CVAA the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act of 2010 now, any video game that enters development as of January 1st must be fully compliant with this. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what they have to do. It applies to chat functionality. So any video game that has any kind of chat functionality, that chat functionality must be accessible to those with disabilities. Even disabilities um, having to do with no sight at all. Oh, so or, we're not just talking subtitles here. Or the inability to speak. All of the features of chat functionality must be accessible to these people. So how does that work? Well, I don't know. Rocket League, I suppose, has a way to do it, right? Like if you want to say something generic, you press the chat and you hit the direction you want to say it in. Uh, that seems like a, a, a solution. Uh, any video game that is already in development and hasn't released yet, they must try to be as compliant as possible. What are the consequences? You can be sued. Um, the, uh, the FCC actually has jurisdiction over this. Hmm. So, uh, anybody who does, who sees a lack of accessibility can take it up with the FCC. But it's not like they go through a review process before they can release their No, game. I think it's, com- I think it's, you have to be self-compliant. Wow. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting. Yeah. That's a big deal for developers. Yeah. Any game. Yeah. I mean, it, a lot of games just won't implement that type of check functionality and rely on third parties and they'll be on the you know the discords to to build that in. Yeah, I think and one of the big takeaways I had from reading the comments was that a lot of gamers think this is a pain in the butt and don't see the reason for it, sadly. 
Um, but uh, there's also a lot of people who are saying work with people with disabilities. Yeah. Don't make assumptions on what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. And that won't cost you anything. Yeah. And one of the more successful things uh, last year was the Microsoft, uh, the, the Xbox peripheral. Which yeah. accessible like, peripheral. Got a great commercial launch mm. um, yes. over the holidays. Oh, did it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. That's it for tech news. Let's move on to our next segment. Oh, cool. Uh huh. Where'd that thing go? There it is. I'm a pinball nerd. Pin, 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 pin. Just to my point. Finally, pinball. That makes me very happy. You guys remember the monsters? To the yes. before our time. TV show. It is. It was a TV show, uh, black and white. Um, sort of like the Adams family, and they are making a monster's pinball machine, Stern Pinball. Where's the demand for this coming from? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. However, pinball is uh, has a rich history of having licenses that have that aren't really so much about the demand. It's about the cost <laughs> and th- being able to get assets that you can build something with, and maybe appealing to the a generation that can afford, uh, you know, to buy a pinball machine that is from an, a different era. That's not Nostalgia necessarily is, popular now. Nostalgia is very powerful. And I have to say, if you look at the images, if you click that link, IGN has a good article. You can see all the uh, different versions. Stern, as always, has three versions of the pinball game, a pro, a premium, and a limited edition. The pro is uh, colorful and $6,000, but there's an interesting premium model that has a black and white playfield and cabinet, which I think looks gorgeous. They use the same plastics throughout, which is an interesting approach. So they use the same plastics as the Pro, and the plastics were designed so they kind of blend into a black and white background, whether you have it or not. And uh, both the Premium and the LE have a lower playfield with some interesting features, um, including a wire form and a vertical up kicker, which we I don't think we've ever seen in a lower playfield. So this is, it's pretty neat. It's designed by John Borg, who you know, isn't like a superstar, but he's he's done a lot of games, uh, including Tron. Um, and it's, I can't wait to play it because it does look fun. It's got a little dragon that sticks his head up on the ramp if you sh- try to shoot it. Like, he'll, he'll block it. Is there it. a dragon monsters? Yeah. It's, what's it called? Spot? Is it a dragon? Oh, it was the pet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You do remember the monsters. I do. I, I don't know if I've ever seen it. I, I Frankenstein. Is that, is it Frankenstein? Yeah. Who, who's that guy? He, uh. He I was, think it's Fred Munster, right? Isn't yeah, yeah. that his name? He was in Pet Cemetery, right? Like he was the old man in Pet Cemetery, and that's how I knew him, and then I realized, oh yeah, he was part of the Munsters. Anyway, it's it's the first kind of big stern game in a while, since maybe Guardians of the Galaxy. They've had a few other games that they've released, including the Beatles, which is based on an old like nineteen eighties game that we talked about. But this is the first like big scale game and it, it looks surprisingly good and I think it's kind of a daring move to do a black and white play field. And it's done it's got people, you know, on different sides of the fence, whether you like it or not. I dig it. Well done, Stern. I can't wait to play it. Moment of science. So a few stories this week. One is I'm going to start with um, what I thought was one of the more interesting technology-related science stories of the week. Uh, There's a class of diseases that are typically called rare diseases. um, And they... Uh, there's a class of about 7,000 diseases, and they are all over the spectrum. Some are caused by viruses, some are developmental conditions, some are genetic. Uh, they're really wide-ranging. Some of them you may have heard of, some of them you haven't. Like, and, they, and they can be really bizarre. There's like one called Decrim's disease, where um, people have a genetic condition where a big burst of fatty tissue will, um, will grow, but it causes a severe pain. Or uh, uh, there's one disease, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact name of it, uh, where developmentally somebody prematurely ages in their appearance. Um, and so these diseases, while they're called rare diseases, and there's a lot of them, uh, its prevalence is actually pretty common. Uh, the estimates um, say there's about 25 to 30 million Americans that have a rare disease Whoa. of some kind. And because they're rare and they're not 
common and there's so many of them, treatment regimens for them and diagnosing them can be really difficult. Well, a number of these diseases have developmental roots in them. And so researchers actually started applying AI photo technology to try to detect these diseases purely from photos of children. And if you're able to a diagnose the, uh, the uh, children at a young age, it doesn't mean that the disease can be cured or treated or any of those things, but it does lower the burden and the, that kind of period where you're trying to figure out what the heck this is. And so they, they took a number of, of photos, I think 17,000 photos that were trained on images related to 200 rare diseases. Um, and it, produced 91% accuracy at diagnosing the children's conditions based on this library. Did we per, did we previously know that there were visual, visible facial indications of these diseases? A lot of these diseases do have um, pretty clear okay. um, a, effects that you can see, like as, you know, manifest physically. As obvious as Down syndrome? Yes, okay. on that level. Okay. I mean, there's a lot that are more subtle than that, but you have to also look for... Um, a number of different factors. So looking at, you know, sort of proportionality, hmm. uh, even one uh, photos that actually have sort of like IR heat maps overlaid on it um, could have some uh, interesting function. I think this is just one of those. Wow. There's so many stupid AI stories out there right now. And I think CS was loaded with everyone being like, this is AI enabled or uh, neural network this. This seems like a really common sense usage. And but because it's rare diseases, it oftentimes gets overlooked. So that's cool. I love that story. Um, two, if you started playing the Pink Floyd album at the beginning of the podcast, you'd be reaching a perfect moment now <laughs> as we discuss the dark side of the moon. Boy, that was hard. We you got, you got to play it backwards. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You just hit that right moment in Eclipse where they talk about the dark side of the moon. The moon is tidally locked to Earth, meaning the same face is always showing to us. Mm -hmm. uh, China sent a... Uh, a, um, a craft to the moon, but to the dark side of the moon, one the of the far faces. Side. Far side. It's not dark all the time. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. People call it the dark side of the moon, but it's really just the far side of the moon. How Earth-centric. And, and sent some images back. And it, it shows that it's not entirely dark. It's kind of brownish. <laughs> <We've>, <laughs> Einstein thought so. <laughs> we have confirmation. We have proof. Uh, this is less about, like, I. there's less of a Ooh, big scientific win here. We figured out the dark side of the moon's not dark, but it's more of a <laughs> a move for that for that space program in China. But to be able to successfully launch uh, and land a a uh, craft on the in that area of the moon, and we confirmed no transformers were present. <laughs> Are there none? Oh no, uh, I didn't even watch that movie, but I still got that reference, I which I feel it. bad about. Uh, okay. You know, what's sad is that apparently in Chinese media, this was it was a big deal for sure, but it was not like the biggest story there. Like interest uh, for people monitoring social media in China has shown that like it's really? it's yeah, it's a news story, it's newsworthy, but it's it's not the rah rah you know NASA huh. moment that we've had. Oh, really? Huh? I didn't know that. That's interesting. All right. So a biologist is walking in the woods and feels some drops of water hit her in the face. And it, it's coming down like rain, but it's not raining. It gets really curious. What could that be? I know that seems like the beginning of a really um, bad joke. It's dew that is dripping off of the leaves. It's a f kind of dew. It's like a mountain dew. dew. It's more like a doo doo um, because there are these oh, insects oh, no. that are small um, that are inside uh, atop this tree and they latch on to the leaves and uh -huh. they basically cycle through an enormous amount of water for their size. They're only about like... Cycle through? Uh, they're only about they a centimeter big. perspire the water or do they no, urinate? they pee urinate. Out. They urinate. Yeah, so these are called uh, glassy sharpshooters. <laughs> and what's really interesting about this is like they cycle through so much water in the plant and they're so small that most of what's coming out is just water. It's not really pee. Um, but what they found is, is how is it coming down so fast? How are these drops coming so fast? Yeah. So they actually photographed it at high speed, mm -hmm. did video, and it is coming out 
their pee mm. is being generated and flicked away by two hairs at their end of their anus what? faster than a cheetah can run. Is one of the fastest things in nature. I mean, there's a couple things that are faster. Do they propel the, themselves with this? No. Does it help them boost? They just have these two tiny hairs that protrude out from the yeah. end of their anus, and they kind of flick. They flick it. They flick this bead of water that so it, like quickly forms. Every action in, in microseconds has an equal but opposite reaction. But I they're latched they're... onto uh, the leaf itself. Oh, they haven't evolved to use that thrust. I mean. It, this is I mean, a great question. If you're catapulting your pee away, what can you do with the energy generated from that catapult? That's amazing, sure. Uh, it's not as fast as the end of a tentacle of a jellyfish, which can snap at yeah. hundreds of Gs, yeah. um, or the punch of a mantis shrimp, but it's still pretty fast. Uh, I think that's. I think that yep. is a great note to end on. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. We did a bunch of VR talk at the beginning of the show at CES, but the few things left over uh, not announced at CES. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an update to the Rift PC side. That's right. So you're familiar with the public homes feature. You've been able to sign up for it by um, entering the beta program where you can share your home, Oculus Home, the one that you've designed. You've clearly spent hours and hours in there changing the rug, making sure the environment is as you like it. It's a great place while waiting for someone uh, to jump on Discord to just throw things or fire the Nintendo Blaster. <laughs> uh now you can you can set them up for public so you can invite people over uh, or just allow people to visit it when you're not there. And that is going public. That is going every, it's rolling out to everybody this month. But you won't be there. Uh, you can. You can do multiplayer. You can do multiplayer? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Cool. And, uh, but you can also just set it up for people. So I have mine set up for friends only. And I actually, um, somebody logged in and told me they liked my room. Very nice. Yeah. So I'm thinking about opening up the public. And if you do open it up to public, Oculus, you may have a chance at Oculus featuring your room in their list of featured rooms of the week. And it's like HGTV coming to your house. Yeah. Be like, I like your style, bud. <laughs> uh, so there's that. And you will also uh, be able to stream directly to Facebook video. I, they just need more, more building blocks, things to make. A well, the library of assets. It's true. There were more released in the past couple of months. Like there were special Halloween ones, like uh, you know, old, old Castlevania style furniture, and uh, there was Christmassy stuff. You put hang some, I probably still have some stockings up in my home. I you think know, I'm, I'm the only one here who has actually spent any time. I, I feel like this is a perfect example of something that you could spend a lot of time in, but because you can only appreciate it while in VR, I think it would be better served if there was some representation of it that you could appreciate even when you weren't in VR. So kind of like how Facebook did like the 3D images, like something like that. Or or like just like if you think of your home as a, a, a virtual space and you're spending this time decorating it, you know, maybe like a way I can you can tap into it okay. like a Facebook messenger style a camera well, that you can peer into it. What about this other feature I mentioned? Live streaming to Facebook. So, so you can now do live, that just Run it nonstop. From Dash 2.0, anything that you're doing in VR can now be live streamed up to the cloud. And the camera system will be from your perspective. Still. Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Yeah, I want the fixed camera. I want a security cam into my virtual space. Mm -hmm. that I can just open a browser, type in my address, and see and look into the space as if it's a real space. Mm -hmm. uh, or volumetric modeling, like, like the, the looking glass. You know, if I had like a, a desktop volumetric model of my space, I can yeah. just peer into it. That'd be cool. Well, that the Facebook Meetings app, what was that? Facebook Was it Spaces or something? Spaces, yeah. Uh, they they kind of got into that a little bit. They had a window you could right. place. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I want I want to put able to put like, a little camera. Yeah. It makes sense. Right. I mean, that it requires it to be running the whole time. Uh -huh. like, like, and that's that's the problem, right? This is bandwidth and, and server time. Right. But, but if you could, you know, rent out real estate, which is just server time, Pay to have a space. Persistence. Persistence is what I want. I, I'm really curious about the live streaming feature because I've tried to watch some VR live streams on Twitch and they're hard to follow. I'm curious if the experience will be better with this live streaming to Facebook. 
I don't think it'll be any different. It's just more I convenient. I don't suspect it will be any different. The stuff you already see on Twitch, at least, I mean, that's probably better because those are people who have taken the time to incorporate a green screen and a camera of themselves yeah. and composite it in OVR. Was it OVR? OBS. Yeah. I don't know. But it's convenient. Uh, what else? We got Rec Room has revealed some stats from last year. Oh, yeah? Yeah. How many um, have people have installed Rec Room across all platforms, would you imagine? A million. It is exactly over. Well, it's over, but it's over one million. Oh, yeah, it's a good milestone. It is. It is. Uh, Four hundred thousand player created rooms, which is pretty good. Seventy million room visits. That's good. I wonder how. I, I have not made a room in Rec Room, but they have a lot of interesting maker tools in there. I would I'd be curious how many people play the quests and what the division of yeah, playtime is between they, different quests. They did not say that. Five million photos taken, 5.2 million friends made. I mean, definitely fewer people than they were hoping because they added saves. Save? points. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, they also have fewer players than they wanted. Otherwise, they wouldn't have allowed flat screeners in there. Yeah. No hard feelings. Um, and I think that's it. Well, we got the USB-C adapter. There's a so if you have one of the newfangled video cards that has the USB C, uh, you know VR virtual link. Thank you, virtual link port. Uh, you can uh, use it on your Rift, not on your Vive. Yes. So this is an adapter that goes from USB C to uh, USB Type A, USB three Type A, and also yeah. a um, HDMI. Big old box that you plug your Rift into. It's a cells. It's a third party adapter, but it is certified Oculus ready. I don't know why you'd do this. Technically, it also works as an extension. I guess if you want to use that port and you don't want to take up an HDMI and a USB 3 jack. And it's an extension. Yeah, it is an extension. Okay. Right? Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, it doesn't require any extra power, but you know, you're also already pulling a lot of power on that video card anyway, probably. All right, other than 50 bucks available uh, next week, January 14th. That does it for this week's episode of us not being at CES. Unfortunately, we'll be back next week with more Tech Talk. Any other uh, fun things at CES you guys may have spot, please let us know. You can always reach us on social media at Enchan, at Jareware, and at Science Quiche. Um, and that will do it for us. We have an outro, Jeremy? We will. We'll have an outro. Yeah, we will. I don't know. i got to sign Fill in. Fill time. Fill time. Fill time. Anything coming up on Tested? Uh, tested. Uh, no more Twitch ooh. streams, right? No, we yeah, did that at yeah. the end of last year. It was a lot of fun. I mean, there might be some stuff in the future. We've been doing some um, shooting some model behavior um, and new episode model paper. It should be actually dropping uh, in the next day. So look forward to that. Or as you're listening to this, probably, on, on Thursday. All right, here we go. Hi there. I didn't see you. Test it. I mean, there's the Hermes model if you want to spend some money. Hermes, Jeremy. Sorry. <laughs> Did we already play that one? Probably. Maybe. It's a good one. I'm going to do this one, too. All, All right. right. He, he sent two. Hi there, I didn't see you. Test it. Gunther, grab the camera, trail Norm, let's live stream this baby. That's a good one. Who's that from? Cresimir um, Valjak. I think we should just do that. Let's go find Gunther. All right. <laughs> See you next week.